Hello, family and friends. Welcome to another Talks with Lim Lee. This is available to the billions of people around the world on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and and all the platforms. Facebook short clips? Fa- uh, Facebook uh, video. Facebook, yeah, Facebook page videos. Um, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm actually doing LinkedIn. I don't know why. I'm just testing that out for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Load it up. <laughs> um, I'm a software engineer. Um, I'm, I'm also Lim. I bring the perspective <laughs> of doing uh, software engineering for 20 years or nearly 20 years. Today, my sidekick is Emmett Morgan, Las Vegas realtor in pursuit of truth. I'm here to talk with Lim Lee. And today we are talking with J. Robert Parker. Tell us about you. What, what's, what's your gig? Yeah, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Uh, like you said, my name is J. Robert Parker. I'm a union certified master hypnotist and the founder of Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research. I'm just here kind of helping clear up any misconceptions, any myths about hypnotherapy and answer any questions you guys might have. Any questions your audience might have come up with, whatever have you. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. You got to convince us that it's not all uh, magic tricks. I mean, some of it is. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> Everything's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Let's get into the talk. All right. So we spend three hours talking about hypnotherapy. We talk about some of the psychology behind it. Um, we talk about even things that uh, an individual can do for themselves. There is uh, like what you could try to uh, hypnotize yourself. Some positive changes for yourself through that. Uh, connections with meditation, connections with uh, uh, psychology. And we talk some politics, a little bit of Metallica and Pantera. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay tuned for that. <laughs> so you're a certif- certified master uh, hypnotherapist? Certified master hypnotist. Is there... Uh, a- Oh, go ahead. I'm actually currently working on uh, my certified hypnotherapist. I'm in college for that at the moment. Uh, but at the current level I'm at, I am a master hypnotist. That's what the, the fancy Ta-da. union certificate for. With, with that certificate, the, the union behind it, is that a government body? Is there like a government? It's, it's not government. It's a AFL-CIO, I think it's called. Uh it's some type of international union. Uh, I can't remember who all is affiliated with our specific union, but a lot of it's like unusual professions like that. Hypnotherapists, uh, um, stylists, things like that. Some hmm. of the less traditional unions. Is there, is there a, um, for other, is there other hypnotherapist unions that are, sanctioned or controlled by government as in who do they have a certain um none oh none oh i thought okay interesting um are you asking if it's a regulated field is that what you're i I thought i thought i heard somewhere that there is a regulated um field in in well no uh outside (laughs) of uh like two states uh connecticut i believe is one and washington is the other and that's kind of the tricky thing because like I went to a 720 hour college program I got all of this education on a diversity of subjects however uh, somebody that took a weekend class can drag the same title behind their name that I do yeah and that's kind of the trick that you run into with an unregulated industry is you get a very large spectrum of talent and that can generally be through, through speaking to somebody and through seeing their knowledge and how they present themselves and their comfort level. It's, it's pretty easy to find out. But I, I do like to warn people, like, for, uh, for as well-researched as a field of hypnotherapy has become, there are still, I don't want to call them charlatans because they're still employing hypnosis. Oh but they aren't as well educated on the subject as they should be to be dealing with the subject matter that we deal with. Uh, 
if you're just out there with a weekend class helping people lose weight, that's fine and dandy. But if you're out there with a weekend class and nothing else trying to help people overcome childhood trauma, you might do more harm than good. <laughs> ah, that's a very good uh, explanation and distinction. Where are some of the, or have you seen any stories where they, they go bad? The negative influences of hypnotherapy really can be most recently seen in the 1980s uh, uh, during the satanic panic thing where everybody thought that there was a cult in the woods and that KISS was recruiting people for some satanic army. Uh, hypnotherapists were employed to try to get testimony from children and while getting them to recall the memories, they altered their perception of them. Yeah. Because with, with looking back from memories with hypnosis, you're not going to get some perfect version of it. You're going to get that person's perception still. And that perception can be altered in hypnosis. And that's what was being done, is these, these children's testimonies were being altered so they perceived that they were being abused so that they would testify against these people. And because of that, uh, memory is a very touchy thing with hypnotherapy. People ask if they can recover lost memories and things like that, and generally not a good idea. Uh, yeah. If your subconscious makes you forget something, there is a good reason for it, and it's trying to protect you. Uh, that's your subconscious is really one of its main goals, is to try to protect you and preserve you, because if it doesn't, it dies. Is it fair to say that our memories are faulty altogether? Because I mean, I'm sure I'm sure we all remember. I'm sure we all know um, we've remembered things incorrectly before. And uh, I can it, actually say yes, and one up you on that. Let me ask you two very interesting questions. Um, do you think you have free will? Uh, from the, the some of the documentaries I recently watched, where they've they said that they could record within a uh, millisecond. They're, they're, they they have some uh, brain activity recordings where they're able they could ask somewhat of a they ask a yes or no question, and they actually are able to record that the brain is saying yes or no before the person says yes or no within milliseconds. So, uh, well, I don't just mean how you react. I mean uh, everything about you. Oh, everything about your personality and the way you think feel do you think that is an act of freedom my answer i think would be yes <laughs> I, I everything think, yeah I, I think you could say hey none of us chose our life and our situation you didn't choose the brain cells that are firing the way they're firing we didn't choose to set up who we are in this moment i think that's well, fair to say who you are in this moment is a series of associations based upon your experiences in life it is the connections that your subconscious has made and directs your behavior with. So that's one of the weird conclusions I've kind of had to come through through doing this is we, we lack a lot of free will, at least not as we don't have as much as we thought we did. Now, there is another side to that and that you can exercise free will because for as much as we are just a product of our associations and the things that we have learned, through hypnosis and hypnotherapy, you can consciously decide what you do and do not want. Therefore, you can exercise free will upon yourself and actually gain it by altering your behavior. Oh, so, so if we choose to use hypnotherapy to select a future course of action well and you're gaining some example. level of what are you afraid of like what's your fear my checkbook checkbook no. <laughs> uh well i mean i yeah, can still work with that yeah in, insecurity about uh having future resources right so yeah. like i, I gotta well, work i gotta pay bills i gotta what if you didn't have that anxiety what if it was just something that you inherently knew you would take care of what if those subconscious associations that made you worried about the future, made you comfortable about the future because of a comfort in your current path. Everything that we do is subconscious association. Why we fear what why we why we fear what we fear, why we love what we love, 
everything is some form of subconscious association. Uh, our conscious mind, what's here right now, is only 12% of, of our thinking. Well, 10 to 12, it's the numbers vary even either way it all ends in. The majority of your brain is not your logic and willpower and conscious mind. The vast majority of it is that subconscious. And it has different rules and things that it's wanting to do. Um, to your subconscious, the, the greatest drive that it has is to maintain something we call homeostasis, which is a really fancy word to say normal. Yeah. It is your sense of self. It is what you perceive as normal. And it will do anything to preserve that, up to and including sabotage. That's why whenever people try to elevate their circumstances, they, they can't seem to, they can't get past that because whatever it is about it has not elevated past that. Um, a good example would be, uh, say something easy, say stop smoking. A lot of people try and try and try to quit smoking and I'm their last resort. And first thing I ask is why do you want to quit smoking? And if you say something like, oh, my wife's on my ass to get me to quit, or I can't smoke at my job anymore, so I have to quit, I can't help you yeah. because you, you still want to smoke. But if you come to me and you're like, I, I know this is going to kill me. I have to stop smoking for my kids. I want to stop. It just always drives me back to that. I can't. And most often what that is is either – your current homeostasis, your situation, your normal, or a past association, some of the, the initial positive association with smoking. So if it's to look cool around your friends or to get a break at work, there's still that, that subconscious association that's being hung on to that's my job to, through interviewing and through hypnosis itself, to find out what the core root of this is and kind of pull you away from that habit. Uh, the other alternative is negative feedback, and I can just make you hate smoking. And it's also a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I like this. Can you explain that? <laughs> if somebody wanted to uh, quit smoking and you want to... So if, if, they didn't, if they just wanted to, to brute force it away and they didn't want to just slowly do it and they want to do it as fast as possible, yeah. I, uh, I've done this before. I would actually have some smoke in session with me, light up a cigarette, smoke while we do this. And while in hypnosis, I'll have them take a long drag. Now then be like, now focus on that smell, on that taste. What is that taste? What chemical is that? What taste is that exactly? It's hot though, and it tastes like a very bitter chemical, like something you don't want in your mouth and don't want in your lungs. Yeah. In fact, you might begin to notice you begin to notice flavors in the cigarette that you've never noticed before and that offend you. And after a while of doing that, uh, the taste of the smoke, because even our association with taste to a certain extent is subconscious. And well, that so sounds they, great, though. That, you're using that to get a positive result, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that can be done with, with most things, really anything you want to start or stop because it's as i said it's all association it's all this mm. subconscious drive that you have and another thing that because I, I work with a lot of trauma like overcoming past trauma mm -hmm. and one of the things that i stress to people when they first come to see me um is that say something happened to you when you were 10 or 11 Whatever it was that happened to you, you still perceive with that 10 or 11 year old's mind and emotional maturity and thought process, even though you yourself had developed that memory, that perception of that traumatizing moment is still that of a child, even 50 or 60. Like, like they're reliving the moment? Kind of, but there is, there's sometimes that there are flashbacks sometimes. But even then, even if it's like, uh, let's say a car wreck you got into when you were seven, yeah. when you, 
you remember that as a small child, everything is bigger, everything is louder. You don't understand fully what's going on. And even later in life, when you do understand what went on, you've not yet readdressed it. So yeah. in hypnosis, we could go back and with your current adult logical mind, we could walk you through a reassessment of that traumatic event and give you an understanding of it subconsciously that you didn't have before. On your pre one of your other podcasts, I've uh, remembered you saying about 20 to 30 percent of people are su uh, suggestible. Oh, to, uh, suggestible automatically to me or to you or to anyone. A hundred percent of people can be made suggestible. Oh, that whole thing about like I'm sure you've heard that like eighty only eighty percent of people can be hypnotized. Mm. Uh, that comes from a very old way of thinking with hypnosis that was only using literal language to try to mm. hypnotize somebody, and there is a set of the population that will not respond to that kind of language. I'm one of them. So what you do is. Um, use inferential language where as before i'm sure you've heard the whole you are getting sleepy your eyes are getting heavy yeah that's a physical induction and I, I say that but I, I use jargon and i don't mean to that is a literal induction uh an inferred induction would be uh, you may begin to feel your eyes getting heavy if you begin to feel that you can let yourself close your eyes you may begin to feel a little drowsy. And if you choose to, go with that feeling. It's, it's control is what it boils down to. Mm. There's a set of the population that you can give direct commands and control to. There is a set of the population that, for lack of a better term, you have to make their subconscious feel like it's their idea. Yeah, I can tell you um, when I was in college at San Diego State, I took a psychology class, and uh, there was one section on... Uh, hypnotism and you know i'm a i'm a young dude i'm like ah oh, bullshit whatever Hyp you know hypnosis well, you know give me a break uh so the teacher puts on this video and uh you know they turns the lights off and we're watching this video and they're you know it's like a, a quick documentary about hypnosis and then she stops at midway um because they're they're saying you know you're going back to your childhood and you're writing in your childhood and handwriting and she stops the video and we, and we look over and one of the dudes in the class was kind of falling asleep and he was doing exactly what the video was, was suggesting him to do. And I was like, Oh, I'll be damned. I guess it does. You know, there's not total bullshit. Yeah. This, this dude clearly <coughs> is being, you know, influenced by the video of getting well, hypnotized. Here's, here's an interesting fact. Uh, you're in hypnosis naturally twice a day, uh, bare minimum. Mm. Uh, have you ever woken up like first thing in the morning when you, first come into consciousness and you have that moment where something just clicks it comes together you know what you need to do or you have an idea some moment of inspiration or clarity yeah everyone's had that that's hypnosis you're in trance uh 30 minutes before you wake up and 30 minutes after your your brain is in trance state and that's that same the way everything comes together in that moment, when you have that moment of clarity, that is hypnosis in general. That's kind of the way it feels. People ask a lot, like, how's this going to feel? And the best comparison I have is when you get up in the morning and you don't have to get out of bed, so you just get to lay there for a while. And that same calm kind of contemplative state that's hypnosis. Mm. That, that's and that's that state can be guided. Um, there are people that are much, much, much more prone to hypnosis than others. Mm -hmm. About five to ten percent of the population tests as what we call sonambulists, which usually referred to sleepwalking. But uh. in a way, it's kind of similar because these people they're the ones that hit right in the middle of the suggestibility spectrum. And they, they go through life hypnotized sometimes. Mm. They're just always right there on the brink of being able to be hyper-suggestible and in a trance state. Very often, if you've ever met somebody who's very emotional, who reacts to things very quickly and very deeply, 
usually a somnambulist because mm. every everything that's being said to them is a subconscious suggestion, a, a statement that speaks directly to their subconscious. And a lot of what I have to do with my somnambulistic clients is teach them how to recognize when they're in that state, how to get themselves out of it, how to remain present, not be hyper suggestible to all of these influences around us. Give them more free will. Give them more free will. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, it's for the somnambulists, it's even less so yeah. because they're running around hyper suggestible, mm -hmm. which means they're whatever's around them is directly affecting their, their subconscious and the choices that they make in a way. They're the perfect people to advertise to because no matter what you do, those, those logos and slogans and songs are going to stick in their head. Mm. Uh, go back. Uh, I'm jumping back to uh, when you asked me, do I think I have free will? Define free will to you. Earlier, I, maybe I didn't understand it well enough the way you explained it. Uh, is free will su suggestible and or what? I, okay, what, what is free will in your defini definition? Let's go with that free, first. Free will is you consciously making decisions based upon logic and your own thoughts apropos of no outside influence you you make a decision and your choices based only upon your own freedom and capacity to think and there's there's always going to be some autonomy involved with any any living thing but seeing seeing how rapidly and how readily we are able to change. I have clients for weight loss that I see them uh, like a week and a half apart, yeah. and I don't recognize them ses into session. Like there's such a difference in their physical appearance, in their demeanor, and everything because hmm. of this new way of thinking which they started to have. And it's I, I wasn't too sure about any of this before I went to college for this. Like, I'll be honest. Yeah. My, the majority of my experience was with an old hypnosis book from, like, I think, 1907. Huh. And that was as wacky as you think it would be. <laughs> and um, But I, I talked to the, the admissions, and they had a lot of interesting things in the program. And they said that 101, the first section, is free. It's a month long. Uh, you can decide whether you want to take the full program or not after that, but you're, you're welcome to come. What if they're just and using that class to hypnotize you to take more classes? <laughs> that was proposed. Um, <laughs> I guess it works. That was then. absolutely proposed. I guess that's proof that it works. <laughs> I don't know because there was a huge dropout rate. Okay. Like, uh, the, uh, the initial 101 class of yeah. like 30 like four or five of those made it oh wow uh because it's you can 101 is all you need to learn how to hypnotize somebody like yeah. after that like you, you can learn how to trance someone you can learn how i can teach someone how to hypnotize somebody in an afternoon it is not difficult it's knowing how to do it to everyone uh it's knowing how to adapt to a situation it's knowing oh. the questions to ask the techniques to use to properly address whatever those needs are. Trance is fine and trance is wonderful and all, but as if you're wanting to do anything more than get people up on a stage and do some shit with them, you're, you need more. Uh, yeah. So should we uh, clarify for the audience when, when most people think about hypnosis, they're thinking about something like that magic yeah. show, right? Something like a <laughs> stage, a street performance mm -hmm. kind of thing. So can you, can you expand on that and say, when, once you go beyond the entertainment of seeing somebody get hypnotized, what is that world beyond? Well, uh, other than, well, there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. I know a lot of hypnotherapists personally that do stage shows every now and again. Yeah. Uh, I do know of stage hypnotists that have no interest in the therapy end of it. Uh, from the other end, uh, hypnosis is, very similar to just normal therapy. Mm. But the difference is, is, say in that first half of the session, 
that we're talking. I'm listening to different things. I'm, I'm guiding the conversation different places because I'm looking for the metaphors that you use, the way that you describe your situation, because the language that you use is the language that your subconscious listens to. Um, so if you refer to your, your problem as a pain in my ass, I'm going to refer to it in hypnosis as a pain in your ass. Uh -huh. That's how you associate it. Uh, pay attention to the words that are used. Uh, pay attention to any emotional reaction to uh, a word or a phrase or a situation. And with all of this, this data that I've gathered, I put you in hypnosis and there is a variety of techniques and processes that I can go through. But I basically feed you back your own problem and change your associations. And the way that I do that really depends on the problem, really depends on the association. Um, so like if somebody, like we said before, for smoking, uh, if they thought they look cool in front of their friends yeah. and there's always that, that's still their drive. They think they look cool. Uh, there's a, different ways I could go about it, but one way would be to give them that outside perception to see themselves alone smoking in the rain or out mm -hmm. in the heat. And through that visualization in hypnosis, ask them, does this person look cool to you? Does this person look like they're having fun or that people admire them? Yeah. And through that perspective, they see, no, it doesn't. Because that's Hypnosis is almost a moldable dream state, and mm. it's the strangest thing. Some people experience it more vividly than others. I have clients that I can craft a complete experience with. Sight, sound, smell, touch, everything, and they'll experience it. I myself don't. Um, I My mind wanders a lot. I make a lot of connections in my head in hypnosis, and I like like if you tell me to visualize walking down a staircase i will feel like i'm walking down a staircase like there'll be that same sensation under my feet and that same dropping sensation mm -hmm. but other than those occasional physical sensations i don't get too much i'll laugh sometimes because it's it's a trip it's a trip to have somebody tell your hand to move Tell it to do something and you don't consciously make it move but it's yeah. moving that makes me laugh every time <laughs> like, uh, wait could you make me like salads more yes because <laughs> i i eat salad and i eat vegetables purely because i know they're good for me i don't have any inherent desire oh, you know i would always choose a roast beef sandwich given you know if, if i uh, have choices I can, yeah i can absolutely change your perception on the way something tastes. Yeah. Um, I've, I've done experiments with it even with, I like, I don't like onions or I didn't like yeah. onions. So I tranced myself and tried to see if I can make myself like onions because self hypnosis is a thing. Yeah. And it took a couple of tries, but yeah. Now you love I'm onions. With onions now. Yeah. <laughs> He's down with onions. Cool with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's hope. And, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's that's the trippy thing about hypnotherapy is there's not I, I've got a thing on my website that's like 145 uses for it. Yeah. Literally anything from <coughs> overcoming crippling childhood trauma you suffered with your entire life to Yeah. I don't like salad. Like it's cuz it's all all these associations. It's all what your brain is telling you. And that can be, I don't want to use the word tricked, but it can be changed. And yeah. This is an example of what I say of when I say free will. Did you choose to not like salads? No, I just am that way. Yeah. You can choose to like them though. Yeah. With hypnosis, you can change your perception and choose to like them, thus exercising true free will. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I would grant that, you know, if, if it's something you naturally don't do, but through logic and reason, you say, you know, I should, I should like vegetables and salad more. 
And if hypnosis helps you get there, then you are choosing Absolutely. to do something that's not natural. Or, or, yeah. um, I, a lot of my weight loss clients have a specific food they fixate mm-hmm. on, be it chocolate or cookies or cake. There's usually a reason for it. Yeah. But I, I, I tell people that it's not, you're not going to dislike these things. You're just not going to have that desire. And it, it blows people's minds every time because after mm. the second or third session, they come back and they're like, I had a piece of chocolate the other day and I just stopped. I've never yeah. done that in my life. And it's just that, that, that trigger, that association in your head that it's just not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, there might be a reason you don't like salad. It could be more than just you don't like the taste. There could be... Someone in your childhood tried to force you to eat salad against your will, and you just didn't want to. So salad trauma. Life, salad trauma. Yeah. Of course, kind. But yeah, and because of that association, <laughs> there is you're, you're still that fucking kid in your head that doesn't <laughs> like salad because your mom tried to force you to eat salad. You want to think that we're grown up and that we're adults, but like, let me tell you, there is way more of the original kid you inside of you with all of those associations and fears and just everything that a little kid is bad at is still in your head. Yeah. You got bullied in school. There is still that part of you inside that got bullied. And maybe that was used to form your behavior now. Maybe that's why you take martial arts. Maybe that's why you started working out and you're fucking huge now. Like it's not not all of these associations and our reactions are bad. Like, mm-hmm. for example, the hypothetical person I just mentioned. He got bullied in school, and he took that, and he processed it into something positive. And that can always be done. We can always process our hurts and our traumas and our obstacles yeah. into something positive, even after the fact, because we can always go back and change associations. So this explains marathon runners. They they want the ability to run away from bullies. You can outrun uh, or, anybody. Or they're just drug addicts. <laughs> oh, really? no, no, no disrespect to any marathon runners out there, but you people got problems with orphans. For, uh, the, for, for the free will thingy, and is that is it people being gullible per se, and is that is it um, um, are people like living people that live in people us. We live in society and we are just going through our way of working nine to five, making money. Are most people suggestible and gullible and therefore the, the connection to free will that you mentioned earlier? Like, Well, it's, it's not a matter of gullibility. It's a matter of development. It's, it's how we and all living creatures develop. We have something in our head called a mirror neuron, which is... The thing that gives us the ability to watch someone else do something and it's we learn through that or we learn through through repetition it's that it's it's literally we we become everything we see we are able to mirror everything we see Mm -hmm. um monkeys have it too that's how they teach each other things through through mirror neurons they just show what you can do and which seems like a really obvious thing because of course you can. Because if you watch someone do something, you automatically kind of know how. Well, that's because we have that special part of our brain. That's mm. that thing that we take for granted. I just watched no three videos on uh, how to do drywall. Yeah. So that I can University repair. of YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do dry, drywall now. I haven't done it yet, but. <laughs> I, I can't tell you all the <laughs> random things I've learned to do off YouTube. It's a great resource sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but it's the, the, the free will thing. It's, it's strange because like you said, you have to ask, what is free will? What does that actually mean? And I, th- I think the difficulty of that question almost kind of points to the fact that we don't have it because it's difficult to perceive what that even is. Because, Mm. let's ask this, what's the opposite of free will? 
What would North be exact Korea. <laughs> North Korea. Well, actually, you, you're, you're kind of on to something. Yeah. Because why do they um, do what they do? Because of association. And sometimes that association is fear. Sometimes that association is propaganda. Uh, this can, of course, be applied to any country that's not just the DPRK. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but even here in America, that's what you're getting absolutely. at. Absolutely. Because everything is a hypnotic modality, almost. Religion, politics, media, any, any dynamic even can be considered a hypnotic modality. Why do we even play this game with society? Why, why do we all dress up and why do we all agree to, to do these things when some of us don't benefit? And you would think that if you were signed up for a system or participating in the system that did not benefit you, that, that you would just leave. Just like if you were in a relationship that was not benefiting you or you had a habit that was not benefiting you, mm -hmm. you would just leave. Like with North Korea. There is so many North Koreans that there is no way the military could keep them under control if they decided to go fuck you, we're going to the south. Couldn't stop it. Why did they stay? Fear for death and, and torture well, and whatnot. Here's, here's part of the interesting thing that explains a lot. Pain and pleasure is different to your subconscious mind. To your subconscious mind, pleasure is what it knows. It's what it's familiar with. It's the homeostasis. Whereas pain is the unknown that for, for as much as that, that North Korean knows that his life is bad, that he lives in fear, he is, what, what's out there? He doesn't know what's better. He can, see, he can see all the propaganda he wants, if he is afraid as he wants, but that's the unknown. Mm -hmm. And that fear of the unknown and of change is what prevents people from changing, or from running, or from going towards a situation that they should. And that's where the elevation of homeostasis comes into mind. Uh, to stay with the North Korean example, there, that, that person's homeostasis would be, I am controlled, I am afraid, I have to do this thing, and this is the person that I am. Whereas you, when you elevate your mentality to, I am a free human being, I am capable of doing everything that I need to do on my own. When you raise yourself up past that programming and past the, the, the level of normal that they're trying to keep you at, that's when you get people break for the line. That's when you get people willing to risk their life to, to run because they have elevated that mentality. They can no longer tolerate their circumstances because in their head, they are no longer a slave. And just like when people are able to overcome bad relationships, they finally move on when they are no longer willing to accept that as their normal. And they elevate their homeostasis to be somebody who is unwilling to be abused, who is unwilling to be spoken to like that because that's, that's just how most people operate. If somebody walks up to you on the street and goes, you're a piece of shit, you don't just go, okay, I'm sorry. Mm. Like, you stand up for it. You stand up for yourself because your homeostasis, your normal, says he doesn't get to walk up to you and disrespect you like that because of the mm. esteem you hold yourself down. Whereas the person mm. that you could do that to, their normal thinks they deserve it. Mm. Their normal is like, oh, I guess I am a piece of shit. That was random. Okay. How and did he know? <laughs> how did he know? Like, but it's just, it's, that's what I mean when it's everything. It's everything from the way you let people talk to you in the street to choosing to have the courage to defect from a tyrannical government. It's the same process. It's while they are wildly different things in terms of consequence it's the same thing it's elevating your mindset to 
can no longer tolerate what you are unwilling to tolerate. And that's when that's that's why these these men, these women, even in the face of you're probably going to die, you're going to have to run across a minefield mm-hmm. to get to where you want to be. I don't care. Because to them, it's better to die because they can't tolerate it anymore. Mm. And if you've ever been in a situation in life that you just couldn't stand anymore, you look back, you got past that by elevating yourself, by, by changing your mindset to no longer accept those circumstances and to move past it. And it's that that can be done with pretty much anything. That's mm. pretty much what's done with smoking, with weight loss, with trauma. You, you elevate your homeostasis. Question so I, that I like to. Oh, bad, bad. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to derail this uh, conversation away from more of your expertise. But what's your Go perspective? So taking North Korea, let's jump to America. What's your perspective on the uh, Facebook, Twitter, the polarizing political situation with America? What's your perspective on all that with people? I think that the American political system is totally broken from both sides and that's 100% self-evident in its practice that the government does not serve the people that I it doesn't matter if you consider yourself left wing or right wing your team's not fighting for you and uh, I believe that the problems in this country and uh, kind of more so the world isn't really a political issue it's a class issue that it boils down to people wanting to, or not people, a certain set of people wanting to keep another set of people poor or miseducated or whatever have you because it is profitable to do so for resources or for your consuming abilities. It's, it pays to have an uneducated consumer base. And it's kind of, I almost feel like we're beyond government at this point this is just like a giant walmart Hmm. seems like at this point and it's do you happen to think that humans our personalities the way that i'm our free not free will and or not gullible our humans person personalities are we too Suggestible, too suggestible to a, from a government to push well, this agenda. That I agree with you. I do. I actually do think the American government. It seems like the agenda is just money, power, and greed. And part the, of the, part of the problem is we hate each other. Like people hate each other. I don't know how old you guys are. I'm, I'm 40, thirty-eight. I'm forty-four. Okay. Okay, 30, okay. 39. Perfect. People did used to be this shitty. You used to be, I mean, people always sucked, but there's this viciousness. And more than this viciousness, there's this, I don't give a fuck about you. Hmm. And that's the bad part. It's the not caring hmm. about your neighbor. It's the not caring about your community. We, we've become so distant from each other. There's endless stories of people that have lived next to somebody for 30 years and they barely know their first name mm. like we, we're a social creature we are a, we're a tribal creature mm-hmm. and I believe that cities are very bad for us like this this concept of living in a condensed small group that is completely separate from each other I used to live in a really large city I've never felt more distant from other people because mm. everyone just wants you to fuck off they're, they've they've got their in their thing one of the loneliest places i've ever been in my life was new york city yeah. because everyone was in their world so you could be in a crowd of tens of thousands of people completely alone no one even notices you. whereas you go to a town of i live in a town of a thousand people Everyone knows everyone. Everyone will talk to you. Everyone yeah. will will interact with you and knows your name, for better or worse. Um, 
Yeah. But I, I think a lot of what's wrong is we've been convinced to hate each other. We've been divided along so many lines that it's just arbitrary at this point. Like they're just finding any way to keep us at each other's throats. And it's a lot of it comes from a lack of understanding, which I, I actually, it sounds weird to say, but going through the courses that I went through and learning the things that I learned really gave me a lot of understanding. I spent the vast majority of my life as a very, very negative person, a hmm. uh, very angry person. Did and you grow up? Did you grow up in New York City, or is that just a no, time I, that you? I that just went to New York at one point. I grew up in a little suburb in Austin, okay. uh, Texas, and it's like I, I literally had the the most suburban upbringing possible. Uh, I just, I only child of a single parent, uh, latchkey kid, yeah. read too much in school, all that stuff. Were, and were like, you in the movie Dazed and Confused? Uh, <laughs> no, but I do remember them filming it. <laughs> I actually do remember yeah. them filming it, and I would eat at that burger joint sometimes. Cause nice. Was kind of, um, so are you back in uh, Texas now, or are you in a different No, state? I'm in Arkansas. Arkansas, gotcha. I, yeah. Yeah, I live in the aforementioned town of a thousand people. Uh, yeah. My practice is pretty much completely remote. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of people I'll see in person. But for the most part, I see people all over the world. It's an ideal situation. I get to live out in the country and get my, my peace and quiet, so to speak. And yeah. with that same peace that I get, I can kind of transfer it to other people. And that's not what made me calm. Like, what, what calmed me down was learning everything that I learned about myself and about other people and about how we think and why we think the way that we do. Uh, it made me way less quick to get pissed at somebody. It's, it also helps that I can trans cashiers. Not that I do. But <laughs> that you can what? Trans, trans cashiers. I don't know what trans cashiers like hypnotized cashiers. Oh, trans them. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't want to deal with somebody, you can just not. Uh, not that I have. You can influence but, their behavior. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the way you talk to people, you it, their conversational hypnosis is absolutely a thing. Uh, Milton Erickson pretty much built his career on it, and he's kind of one of the the forefathers of modern hypnotism. Yeah. But. Like with the suggestibility thing that I kind of touched on, uh, it's called the EMP system. It's emotional and physical. Uh, like I said before, physicals are the more literal ones. Emotionals, you have to use inferential and metaphorical language. Uh, well, there's also a behavioral set to that entirely. Mm -hmm. That's uh, you can even break down with uh, use it for relationships or working with people as different. The different suggestibilities have different needs. And of course, we end up together naturally. Uh, a good example of this, I do an unusual work with relationship stuff for a hypnotherapist. I don't work with couples because I'm not an LMT or an LFT. Um, but I can work with one party. Mm. For example, uh, physical, particularly someone that's a high physical. If you've ever met somebody at a party that's just running around, talking to everyone, center of attention, that's a high fizz. Um, they are, tend to be people that are very social. Uh, in a relationship, they value sex a lot. Like to them, sex yeah. is an expression of <laughs> oh, love. Sorry. <laughs> well, you have an emo. They don't give a shit about sex. And to them, it's more of an inconvenience that has to be done every now and again. They still enjoy it, but it's not an expression of the relationship like it is for the fits. And not knowing this creates problems because the fizz sees their physical affections being rejected. Yeah. For them, that means they're being rejected because if they ever did that, that would, what that would mean is that they were rejecting that person. 
not realizing that this their partner, who is naturally, since they're a high fizz, going to be a high ema, that's not how they view it. To, to them, they, they show their affection in other ways, in mm-hmm. mental engagement, in conversation. And where my role comes in is to explain this to, to mm-hmm. them and let them know the rules. Because once you know, oh, this person isn't interested in me sexually, not because they're not interested in me, they're just not as sexual of a person because of who they are in their head. Um, the, the emotional tends to view career as the most important thing in their life, whereas a physical will view the relationship as the most important thing in their life. And we're, we're all a combination of these mm. things. Very rarely is anyone all one way or all the other. Right. Um, so we'll always show traits from one or the other. But a lot of monitoring even can be done on your relationship. Once you figure out where you both kind of sit on that scale, once you notice something start to go off, you can actually make adjustments to yourself and to your own behavior to make that person's behavior go back to where it was. Uh, Just because of this strange social compensation that we have. Um, That same homeostasis that we talked about will enter into relationships sometimes, particularly family relationships. Uh, An example is if uh, mom and dad start fighting a lot and they're talking about divorce and they got two kids, one of the kids goes out and starts stealing shit from the 7-Eleven and starts Mm. acting out. And it forces the parents to come together and it saves the homeostasis of the family. Uh, and he, no one will even know this is why it's happening. Well, that, that only that works time. if the kid gets caught, right? If they're really that only good. works if the kid gets caught. Okay. <laughs> if they're too good at stealing, then they won't fix <laughs> the exactly. family relationship. <laughs> Where's uh, for a, psycho- a psychologist and like if you had a conversation with a psychologist, um, what are common questions that you guys will discuss and di- uh, maybe differences too? That'd be interesting for me to hear. Um, I'm not sure about differences. Every, every psych I've ever talked to on this subject, uh, which on one of my interviews, the, the guy was even like a grad student. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was one of the most interesting interviews because to him, it's, I almost, it seemed like had some answers that psychology dead ended on mm. because it's one of the reasons, because my company's name is Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research. Uh, I intend on writing white papers, on doing research because there's, this is as, as hard sciences go, hypnotherapy and hypnosis is a very new hard science. Mm. Uh, it's only until relatively recently have there been research papers being written and studies mm-hmm. being done routinely that now we know this is a thing. Now we know that this is irrefutable. So now what questions do we ask? Mm-hmm. Now that we know this, this magic eight ball exists, what questions do we ask? And that's what there's no end of interesting things that are being researched right now with hypnotherapy and with hypnosis. Um, of course, I can't name any off the top of my head right now, even though <laughs> I pretty much do, read these things for fun. Do you find <laughs> that there's a, uh, a credibility challenge to, to see? No. Um, I, that's one of the things I have not run into. Yeah. Right, credibility. Maybe 10 years ago, it might have been brought into question, but hypnosis isn't, the credibility isn't questioned much. Uh, there is, of course, always going to be, but that's the same people that question the credibility of aspirin. Yeah. So uh, I have been called a witch. Uh, a I have witch. been accused. Yeah, I have been accused straight up of performing witchcraft on people. So, like, yeah, there's. Dumb fucks are there, and you're never going to be able to convince them <laughs> otherwise. And, uh, I was traveling around uh, Boston and Maine this uh, past week, and uh, we went near Salem, Massachusetts, 
And somebody was telling me that uh, the old uh, test for a witch is that you hold somebody underwater for some sustained period yeah. of time. And if they survive, okay. then they, they must be a it. witch, right? Yeah. <laughs> the and then you kill them, of course, if they... Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, what's interesting is we make a big deal of the Salem witch trials and all of that. But, like, there was way worse shit going on in Germany and in parts of Europe. Like, yeah. They were, like, dragging people out of their houses and burning them as witches and all that. Like, yeah. there was bad stuff going on around that time. I was just disappointed that Salem didn't have, like, a welcome to Salem, which is not welcome. Because <laughs> like, we drove through. <laughs> they should have had fuck off I think witches. they'd play it up. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's normal people just living there. They don't think it's funny. I mean, I've met people from Salem, and no hate to anyone from Salem. I almost <laughs> moved there. But I've not met a normal person from Salem. Uh-oh. Or, or Massachusetts, for that matter. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, no hate to anyone from Massachusetts. <laughs> we love you. Unless you're, unless you're from Boston, you people need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Very high strung. <laughs> Very high strung. Very yeah. high strung. Of all the random street fights I've almost gotten into in my young adult life, it seems mm. like it was always, always someone from Boston that wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> they got something to prove. Yeah. <laughs> What's uh is this painting behind your shoulder? It looks like a uh, statue of an angel with a bulletproof vest. Uh, Banksy. It's a Banksy, Banksy work. Is? Yeah. Is there yeah. a deeper meaning here, or just something you like? Huh. Something I like. Nice. I was uh, I need something to put up, and I've got a bunch of old Banksy things, and that was the most appropriate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I have other ones that did not make the cut. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's I. A lot of people, an unusual amount of people, and I don't know if this speaks to what I do or people's perception in general. No one ever notices the skull or the Kevlar. I don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but, but then does does the does the work does it does it want to say something or is it just a random image, or is it an interpret as you will? Interpret as you will, really. Yeah. Like find your own meaning. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I keep in my office that has any kind of real meaning other than my nerdy pen collection is I have a, uh, that's, uh, do you know who Marcus Aurelius is? Oh, sounds familiar. I don't know what that is. Uh, Roman emperor, founder yeah. of Stoicism. Uh, that is a silver denarius from his reign, from oh. 1800 years old. Nice. Um, and Aurelius was the, 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 School of Stoicism was all about kind of endurance and keeping your head up through trial, uh, overcoming and keeping your head up. That's why the word stoic comes from, yeah. being stoic. Um, and I don't know, there's, I guess it says a lot about my mental state, is I that ha- that appeals to half of me, yeah. and the other half is, do you know who Diogenes is? No. Sounds great. Diogenes uh, was, actually. Uh, <laughs> he was around <laughs> around the same time as Alexander the Great, and he uh, was basically a derelict hobo philosopher, um, which the, the big famous story is the question of the time was, uh, how do you define a man in the least possible words? Hmm. And Plato said featherless biped well uh diogenes's response to this was to show up to his classroom with a plucked chicken spike it down on the ground and go behold a man uh, and walk out uh yeah and that's what diogenes did and that's why i love him uh he has the quote of saying the only place to spit in a rich man's house is in his face uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's I guess that explains a lot of the way I think when the, the two philosophers I most admire are the the most staunch and stoic person imaginable that actually created the word and the uh, freaky ass chicken punting hobo. Wait, was the chicken live when he brought it to the class? I don't know. You don't know that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining plucking is painful for the, for the chicken. Imagining. Imagining. <laughs> 
but much better for the uh, <laughs> presentation if it's running around <laughs> instead of just laying on the floor. Jumping, uh, oh, I got a question. Jumping back to the, you think city living isn't good for humans? Um, I've uh, we had uh, Renee, a, a psychologist here on our podcast, and I asked her what her thoughts on this concrete jungle, uh, working nine to five. Uh, living so close to each other and whatnot, what would be her suggestions for a better world? And um, we kind of concluded, that, uh, I mean, that we, there's, it's not an easy picture to paint. Like there's so many factors. So it, uh, from your perspective, what, what, if I asked you that kind of. Um, you ever seen a population map in the United States? Yeah, it goes with cell coverage. Yeah, it's basically. <laughs> it's, it's little clusters of yeah. places. If we spread out a little more, we wouldn't be so close. And there is a necessity for cities. And there is a necessity you know, appeal for people to live in a city. But a lot of it is the, the, this mentality of overproduction and consumption that we have, that we need more workers making less that just consume the, the lowest cost products constantly. It's literal nickel and dime economics. Whereas, uh, God, y'all are going to make me go into some kooky shit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you are in Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so do, you, I, do you have several guns in your possession right now? <laughs> not right now. Uh, Texas was way bigger on guns. <laughs> I have a cowboy hat somewhere. <laughs> but that's about it. All right. It would go good with the vest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's... I have a lot of opinions on how we need to fix this. I don't know if any of them are even doable. Mm. Um, I, I think we need to get out of each other's business so much. Uh, I, I'm kind of on the mentality of it's 2021. I don't know how we haven't figured out that we're all just kind of people yet and mm. that we all kind of think and do the same fucking things. And there's, there is no reason in today's society that we shouldn't all, we, there, we shouldn't struggle as much as we do. And I don't just mean us in this country. I mean anyone in any country. There's such mm -hmm. a surplus of production. There is no reason for most of the things that go on in the world. And I don't understand what the end game here is, to be honest with you. Uh, I would surely dread to think that a whole planet goes to extinction so a couple of thousand people could win capitalism. Mm. I, I don't know. It seems strange, but I don't know what the better system is. Um, and that's often used as the excuse to not change it is, oh, well, what are we going to do that's better? Fuck it. We might as well keep doing this. Yeah, I think there's a and quote, capitalism is the worst possible system except every other. Is that the quote? I think that's the quote. Yeah. Or maybe it was democracy. And no, it was capitalism. Capitalism is the worst possible system. Capitalism, yeah. Except every other possible system. And there is a way. <laughs> well, it's... I I like money. so I like I, money a lot. <laughs> I, I do. But the problem is... Here's... I don't think Emmett was, uh, was, uh, he was saying it for himself too. He wasn't saying it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I like money more than most people. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm quoting that idiocracy movie. Uh, <laughs> like money. I like money. <laughs> Go hang out. <laughs> Great movie. I like sex. Yeah. I like sex. <laughs> well, way of baiting. But I, I hate that movie. I wanted fucking blade runner for the future yeah and instead i got idiocracy yeah <laughs> we are that far away from giving yeah plants gatorade like uh -huh. it's and that's what i don't get we there's debate now over things that that don't seem debatable mm. like why are we debating things about race why the fuck are we debating things about race still? It's 
2020 fucking one. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Stop. Stop. Just stop. Mm. It's the strangest thing to me. Uh, one of the most profound things I've heard, I, uh, I learned Russian as a hobby. So I have a bunch of Russian friends. Mm. And uh, I talked to somebody that's very close to my age. So he grew up in the Union. And there was a piece of propaganda that he sent me that uh, was up in cities. And it was a black man on the cart, cart, like stylized, black man on the ground shot. And it said something in the captions about uh, why would you kill your own people? They mm-hmm. didn't believe it. They didn't believe it because they could not conceptualize murdering somebody because of the color of their own skin. Mm. They thought it was a joke. They thought it was propaganda. They thought yeah. no one would ever do that. That that hit me like a ton of bricks. The concept was just so alien to these people. They're like, why would anyone do that? That's insane. Yeah, but they just there's, also no, uh, there's also no black people in Russia, right? Uh, Isn't that a weird... Funny story about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is way back when, when I was in high school. Yeah. We had a foreign exchange student from Russia. And he's a weird guy, because he's mm-hmm. a Russian. And his name was Gogi. I remember that, I think. And we, we asked him, Hey, Gogi, are there any black people in Russia? Yeah. This dude turns, stares at us for like a solid 10 count. He goes, no, they all die in winter. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the strangest fucking thing to me. I don't yeah. know if he's joking to this day. <laughs> I still don't know. It's 20 years later. And I don't know if that man was joking. No, you got to be tough like, to handle those those winters. Because uh, I grew up in San Diego. I, I don't think I can handle a real winter. I think I would it's, die. It's awful. It's Yeah. I, though my friend I talk to in Moscow, like the temperatures he tells me it is sometimes. I I lived in the south most of my life. Like it snows and I panic. Yeah. Like I don't even know. So like he like it snowed last year and I didn't even know what to do. Like we, yeah. we got some of that snow and I'm like, I what do we do with this? We can't go anywhere. Mm. It, it confused me. I I came from a place that if it was 23 degrees overnight, the city shut down. Like, 23, that's freezing. Like they would, <laughs> yeah, they would literally buy out water and milk and bread. Like it was the coming storm. Yeah. And like just for one night of 23 degree weather. And well, that's hell's freezing over, right? thing to me. <laughs> Hell is freezing over, yeah. It felt like it too. Yeah, I know Russia uh, does uh, butt up to Asia in some places, so I think uh, Russia and you know the that the old Soviet Union would have some cultural interplay with some Asian cultures. I think maybe Mongolia awesome. or over in that area. Yeah. So I could Absolutely. see that being a test case for how Russia views racial differences, right? You know, because if everybody's yeah. the same in your country, if everybody's white or everybody's one well, race, then certainly mm-hmm. you can't conceive of the the you racism and the differences. Around. Soviet Union was, I want to say, 15 or 16 different countries. Mm-hmm. If you look around the border of Russia, all those countries are ethnically diverse countries mm. that were all allowed to keep their own culture, their own system. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't want to simp for the commies or anything, but like, were that us, they wouldn't be keeping their culture. They wouldn't be keeping their language. Like, you, you get to learn what we tell you to learn. You, know, you could learn Russian. You were taught Russian in school, and you could move and use that language to go other places. But, like, there there wasn't an attempt really to, to gloss over that culture. And I'm probably pissing somebody off in the audience right now. <laughs> well, that's the beauty with the I three. Don't, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the beauty of a three-hour conversation. So, to, in my opinion, if someone's going to uh, hate you for one sentence. They have three hours to kind of understand you and understand that you're... Oh, let, you're let me tell you, if, 
If you if you hate me for coming to bat for the commies, strap in. Like <laughs> Dude, there's eight Estonians right now, really pissed off at you. They want you to explain yourself. <laughs> Normally, it's Lithuanians. <laughs> <laughs> um, jumping back to uh, uh, something you said way earlier, uh, self hypnotherapy. Therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, is there by chance something that somebody could do by themselves that you could suggest? Something safely, I guess, too. Uh, well, um, self hypnosis is absolutely a thing, and there's there's no end of I'm sure YouTube videos that teach you self hypnosis and things like that. But uh, I teach my clients usually the second or third session. Uh, I teach them how to self hypnotize. And it, depending on their situation is how I do it. Because there's different ways to do it. Um, one of the easiest ways to, to get into that, that trance state is just breathing. If you're in a quiet room and you just, the, the, the rhythm is you breathe in for a four count, you breathe out for a four count. And you make sure that each breath in lasts just as long as the one before and as you get in that steady rhythm of breathing, it actually puts your heart rate into something called synchronous alpha, which is instead of your heart rate looking like that jagged line, it starts to have rounded edges. Mm. And it begins to synchronize with the alpha waves of your brain. And it's the strangest thing. This isn't something I was taught. This is something I observed someone get hooked up to a machine induced into hypnosis and actually observed happening. Um, and that same, that same, we call it a flow state in some places. Like if you ever hear the term flow state referenced in mm-hmm. like corpo speak, uh, they're talking about trance. They're talking about hypnosis. It's just the, the word that they've elected to use. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, it, it's, it does well describing what it is because if you've ever been like so focused on something that time just passes like nothing and you're so intensely focused on it hmm. it's hypnosis it's flow state that's that's that focused state it's what athletes try to achieve it's what a lot of artists try to achieve and it's something that i can help athletes and artists achieve um that that same because any athlete will tell you a vast majority of what they're doing how they're doing it it's in the mind. It's, it's a mental thing. Well, what what if you had some help with that? If there's a there's a saying that I constantly use, uh, it's whether whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. If once you've convinced yourself of something, you you've either already won or already lost. It's it's all in your head mm-hmm. and. I've, I've actually always wanted to work with a fighter because of this, but my the, the reception from the mixed martial arts community to offers of hypnosis has not been good or mature or intelligent. <laughs> They're too um, stoic. <laughs> I got too something. Uh, <laughs> too angry. <laughs> I guess, but to me, for, for all of the, the idiots that laughed me off, I'm just waiting for the one fighter to take me up on it because so much of it is mental. And what, mm-hmm. what could a fighter do if I ensured that you never hear anything but calm, and that you felt pain less, and that you hit harder because you knew you could hit harder. There wasn't that same restraint. So if anyone's listening right now that doesn't <laughs> just want to send me dick jokes, uh, <laughs> Well, so then with uh, like those, I'm assuming we're talking like mixed martial arts kind of fighters. Yes. Um, apparently there's a culture that comes with it, right? A certain very... Uh, apparently. Yeah. I I did not know about it until I attempted to reach out to some places. And I was like, oh, well, okay, well, that's... We'll <laughs> here's be doing that again. <laughs> Here, here's the dick. Cool. <laughs> I, I, I'm... To give you an example... I, I gave my proposal, basically said, I can help you fight better. Were you going to hypnotize me and try to suck my dick? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, what the fuck question is that, dude? Like, uh, that sounds like a request. And, uh, yeah. you know, like, I, I'm, you do you, 
you have fun in that naked rear naked, but like, uh, pass. <laughs> Bye. Well, that's an experience. Is is yeah. there? Uh, jumping back to the uh, that breathing thing that you mentioned is that uh, uh-huh. meditation is uh, where is your perspective on meditation and the connection of that? Um, I actually just uh, had a discussion with this uh, with a peer today. They are the, the 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 way I put it. They are the same body of water, but whereas meditation is swimming around the pool, hypnosis is diving straight in the deep end and getting back out. Hmm. So it's it's the same concept. It's just rather, rather than sit there and float in that state and use that contemplative mindset of meditation. It's more goal oriented. You go in to do a thing, you do the thing and leave. It's, I, I can't meditate. I have tried and tried and tried mm. and I cannot meditate. And a lot of it I come to find out is my suggestibility, but I could self hypnotize very well mm. because it's not as uh, extended of a process. Self hypnotism is actually how I proved the concept to myself because it was still in 101. I was still fresh and learning everything, but we just had our self hypnosis class. So I was like, cool, I'm just going to try this on myself, see if it works. So I wanted to get up earlier, be more productive. Oh, that's good. And yeah, it's a good general one. And first day, nothing happened. So I did it again the following night. And without even thinking about it, I was up at 8.30 in the morning and like cleaning the house and hadn't really realized I was even doing that. Yeah. And I just had a moment where I just kind of stopped in my tracks. And I was like, it's, it's early in the morning. I don't even know why I started doing this. I haven't had coffee yet. <laughs> I don't like, like mopping before breakfast. Yeah, this is weird. <laughs> But it's that, I hate to use a trite saying, it's the power of suggestion, but these these suggestions and these these associations that I speak of, it's it's quite literally everything. It's why we do everything that we do. It's why we think the way we think. Wait, so that's great. You self-hypnotized yourself to get up earlier and get started and get productive. Does that (laughs) still hold true today? Is that still... Uh, I haven't reinforced it because I... I like sleep, yeah. but if I if I had the need, I could absolutely utilize that. If there's something I have to do the next day that is important, or if there's something that, like if I'm going to have a particularly difficult client, not in terms of their ass, but like the subject matter is going to be kind of heavy. Yeah, I self hypnotize to make myself more focused and be able to deal with that better. And what what and does self hypnotism look like? Is it you telling yourself a message, or what? What's the process of hypnotizing yourself? Well, uh, the way I was taught to self hypnotize is I was given two uh, anchor words: one oh. for physical relaxation, and one for uh, like mental relaxation. So you mm-hmm. calm your body, and then you quiet your mind. And in between those things, uh, there's there's this, I, I like to kind of purge out negative thoughts because I still have some of that. And there's a lot to be said about actively going through that motion of exhaling out negative thoughts. It's, mm-hmm. it's like a ritualization of it. And then once you go through those two words, uh, there's something called a staircase induction which is from 20 stairs, you walk someone down, you just do that in your own head. By the time you get to zero, you are within that trance state and you just give yourself a suggestion. You just say it in your head, you can say it out loud, you can write it down on a piece of paper a few times, Mm -hmm. but you just uh, reinforce that suggestion six, seven, eight times, count yourself out of hypnosis, go about your day. And at this point, I can do it in a minute. Mm. Um, there, I, I made my hiccup stop the other day ah. just with self-hypnosis. Uh, I'll use it for pain. I'll use it for calm. I'll use it for if there's ever any sensation 
I want to feel less of, I can feel less of it with hypnosis. And I think it freaked my girl out because I had the hiccups and she was laughing at me about it. And I was like, one moment. And I just closed my eyes and I breathed and I got to that spot and I opened my eyes yeah. and I was like, all done. And she's like, what? I've never seen anyone consciously turn off hiccups. Well, obviously That's, you're a witch, dude. <laughs> obviously. I, as I told the, they told the last person that called me a witch, I prefer the term sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sorcerer man. Uh, that's fantastic. So is self-hypnosis something that someone can try to start, uh, like watching YouTube videos and then trying to do it at home, or, or is that something that's not suggested for... In theory, yes, but I can't really speak to who you're going to watch and what you're going to see. Um, the, the only way I can guarantee uh, solidly teaching you how to do that is by teaching you how to do that by you actually going in session uh me knowing who you are because that depends that the technique that i teach you depends on what i perceive about you and your own personality mm -hmm. will you benefit from a physical anchor more than just these words would the color serve you better uh one of my recent favorite things i like to do for self-hypnosis and any other anchor is smell because mm. what's your most powerful sense memory? Smell. So that same smell that makes you recall an event from your childhood so powerfully decades later can also be programmed in to make relaxation or focus, calm, whatever have you, or link it to the state of hypnosis and let you go directly there. Mm. I can't smell. Once much. you learn how to do it, it's easy. <laughs> Uh, if smell is the is the strongest, but I, I would say the majority of my memories are are visual and or situational. I, I don't think I ever. Um, you don't get smell. Triggered. You don't have. Yeah, you don't have a smell that brings you back. Well, I mean, there are some. Uh, there's probably some, but I can't. I, I would say the majority of my memories are probably more visual. I think. But 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 what I'm what I'm saying is, is that that smell will take you directly back to that moment in time in that same association if you don't have one you got off lucky somehow i'm lucky <laughs> i don't know which one but you know, for, for most people certain smells will trigger memories is that what our yeah. yeah yeah like um baking cookies if your mom baked a lot or the smell of your father's cologne or uh Okay, I just remembered one. <laughs> this old lady <laughs> I used to work with her perfume was an old lady perfume, and every day she would come into the office with this old lady perfume and would just hit the whole office when she walked in. So I still remember it. Well, <laughs> think about that. That 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 I, powerful I, scent association. To I that didn't woman. like it. <laughs> no, but what if that scent association was to a feeling you wanted? And what if, because you didn't like that smell, what if that same sensation of not liking a smell was applied to, I don't know, cigarette smoke or mm. a certain food that you have too much of an obsession with? Mm -hmm. And that same scent association that makes you immediately remember that otherwise anonymous old woman can make you remember anything, any state, any thought, any, any way of being. So you're saying you can take certain smells and re-associate them with something else, right? You can choose to use yeah. them as a tool? Like uh, one of the things that I do with a lot of my uh, clients that come to me with help with anxiety mm -hmm. is I will take them very deep into hypnosis and I'll ask them, do you feel any anxiety right now? And they'll say no. And, I, and I'll ask them, how do you feel? And they'll say relaxed or calm or whatever have you and then i'll have them introduce that smell and with hypnosis i will link that smell to that feeling so in the same way you can get taken back to like a specific christmas or whatever memory mm -hmm. you get taken back to that feeling of being anxiety free being calm immediately anytime afterwards 
So if you're in a situation where you can sense your anxieties starting to creep up, you just keep whatever that smell is on you, close your eyes, smell that smell, and your subconscious, because it associates it with that sense of calm and well-being, takes you back to that. On your website, you have a, like a whole page dedicated to smoking, like as in, I think you probably mm-hmm. have a lot of clients that uh, come in to stop smoking. Um, what other, what other um, common, ser- uh, common things are people going to you to try to stop? Wait a minute. I just saw Jay roll something and smoke it earlier. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about it. <laughs> uh, there is an irony to that i know but again i don't i don't really want to stop smoking so it doesn't matter i can't really help myself okay um but yeah the most common issues i deal with smoking weight loss uh overcoming trauma is probably my main one Mm. Uh, anxiety relief, stress relief, uh, focusing on testing. A lot of people have come to me like specifically during like testing times in school mm. to, to be able to focus more during testing, get rid of some of that test associated anxiety, um, fears and phobias, um, which there's a big difference. Basically a fear is something that has a reason. A phobia has no reason and they are treated very differently. Mm. Um, those are really my big ones. I'm sure there's there's dozens more I can list off. Self-confidence, self-esteem, uh, career focus. I mean, literally anything that you want to, to change or to be better is more than likely something that we can address with hypnosis. Um, goes back to that that interesting free will thing if, if we have free will what and we have this behavior we don't want why don't we just change it yeah that fast why can't we oh well because of those associations has anybody but, ever come to you also, with a fear of clowns um i hear about that often right i'm not making that up right some people no. are afraid of clowns. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of the fears I've dealt with, and clowns has not been one of them. <laughs> okay. uh, I think there's less clowns walking the streets. I, I have encountered somebody kids. with a fear of clowns because I was explaining mindfulness behavior yeah. to somebody, and um, like the, the the easiest way to explain mindfulness is if you ever heard the thing, oh, if you have a fear of public speaking picture everyone in their underwear Uh um but in this case i was telling them they were afraid to go into this building yeah i was like oh don't don't be afraid you're you're picturing all these things in your head so instead picture that there's just clowns pouring out of the building i'm afraid of clowns (laughs) (laughs) don't go in there (laughs) don't go in that building you're afraid of it for a reason (laughs) i'm afraid of clowns in their underwear (laughs) <laughs> because I think they paint their face, but I'm doubt they're not painting their whole body, so that would be disturbing. Depends on the clown <laughs> to see <laughs> where the paint ends. Nice. Depends on the rating of the clown. <laughs> Sometimes um, things get a little wild in the circus. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on one of your podcasts, I I might have not listened enough to it and enough of it. So what I'm, about, I'm just going to take a snippet and then explain to you what I did afterwards by searching uh, Google. So you said. Um, for you, hypnosis is not about causing some, you can't get someone to do something they don't want to do. Now, on when I Googled it on Wikipedia, their definition of hypnosis is the act of getting someone to do something they don't want to do. So, Really? Yes. Okay. Now, maybe... Well, explain that. Oh, go ahead. We're gonna go edit Wikipedia now. <laughs> um. I might, I might have their wording a little bit off, but it, it's basically the opposite of, of what you said on that so, podcast. If I tell you to do something that you would consider morally reprehensible in hypnosis, you will not do it. Mm. For example, if I told you to pick up this gun and shoot someone, you would not do it because mm. 
you can't get me to theory. shoot Emmett. In theory. <laughs> now, however, I was wearing clown pants. <laughs> now, however, if I put you very deep in trance, put a pistol in front of you, and said, "Do you see that squirt gun?" Emmett would think it was really funny if you squirted him in the face with that squirt gun. Uh. Do you see that squirt gun? You do. Okay. Well, pick up that squirt gun and make him wet. And it's you've not asked them to do anything they would consider morally reprehensible. You simply ask them to shoot somebody with what they thought was a squirt gun. Mm -hmm. And that's really where a lot of the nastiness of hypnosis can come into play is the, the dark side of, of hypnosis. Uh, well, the dark side of hypnosis is straight up brainwashing. But ah. that needs like drugs. Um, what you said there, needs drugs? Yeah, drugs. Yes. Uh, well, you don't need drugs to do brainwashing. Uh, it helps. But this is all uh, declassified <laughs> government documents. I like where this is going. Uh, <laughs> it's just got well, wild. <laughs> it's got wild. If you want to see a brainwashing actually get done, <laughs> I've spoken about this a lot. There's a YouTuber by the name of Reckless Ben who does a seven part series where he infiltrates the church of Scientology uh -huh. and at one point undergoes a 10 hour brainwashing session to alter one of his memories. Mm. And that's kind of the difference between hypnosis and brainwashing. Uh, you can brute force thoughts into somebody's head. It takes 10 hours what or was, longer. So he was trying to brainwash something to want to be a Scientologist so, or to get out or what he was doing is uh it was some weird recruiting woman that he was in front of and he had a hidden camera and he she asked him to recall a traumatic memory mm -hmm. and the memory that he recalled was him trying to do a backflip and he broke his neck oh and yeah real winner but through the process of this she eventually convinced him that he enjoyed it that he yeah. was grateful it happened that he was hearing music that he didn't hear and that his friends did not support him and his friend who was present for the, the event had to after this was done reprogram him let him know how it really happened and i don't i don't know for a fact that hypnosis and brute force brainwashing are using the same thing i see no way that they wouldn't be um because sometimes the, the work that I do involves repetition. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all they did, 10 hours of it. Because after a while, your your brain just gets tired of hearing that same thing over and over. It just thinks, okay, I guess this is how it is. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's like that whole, you say something enough times, it becomes true. Like if you call yourself a piece of shit enough times, eventually you believe it. Mm. I'm a great guy and I like salad. Well, uh, <laughs> weird stuff like that works um, <laughs> because your subconscious listens. Yeah. And while it's not that simple, you can't just say a thing like that. Uh, it, it does have an effect. Yeah. That's why I, I encourage people not to have negative self-talk. Don't yeah. talk badly about yourself. Um, I also discourage something called body talk, which is like saying something's a pain in your ass or a pain in your neck because there does tend to be transference to a physical sensation eventually with that. Hmm. Um, a lot of things, a lot of emotions have a transference to a physical symptom. Wait, so there's people uh, who are literally walking around with pain, painful asses? They're walking around butthurt? Never had, never had hemorrhoids? <laughs> I, I did have one. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking hurts. <laughs> <laughs> It was more scary than, than painful. But. <laughs> Jesus Christ, how big was it? <laughs> uh, I, I want to call that guy that backflipped and almost broke his... He did break his neck. I want to call him a dumbass, but I think I oh, almost he's a dumbass. Did, Yeah, I almost did the same thing uh, when I was like 14. So I can't, uh, I can't be too I hard. I think that's enough. about how old he was. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> mm. that's, that's the time of your life you're just going to do the dumb shit. So. Yeah. <laughs> What a more uh, experience with that dark side of uh, hip, hypnotherapy uh, have you had or, or, I don't know, 
Who's who's the most evil hip, hypnotist you know out there? <laughs> <laughs> Who do we got to watch out for? <laughs> oh God, I could say something <laughs> contentious. <laughs> I don't know. Pick a politician out of a hat. <laughs> uh, pretty much anyone is utilizing hypnosis. Ah, I see. Like uh, when you break, they might not call it hypnosis. Right. But you break down the way they speak. You break down, you start paying attention to the words that are emphasized, the cadence of their speech. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there are words that stick out. Like, if I say, for example, uh, we we don't want you to think that these people are bad and that you don't think that they necessarily are bad, but and all your subconscious hears is these people are bad because yeah. this, this the word bad was emphasized. So it doesn't matter that you danced around it a little bit. That word spoke to your subconscious. Mm. Why these people people try to be like, well, I didn't say that exactly no but you had the same it was the same result like you caused the same thoughts yeah because you directed someone's thoughts to go there doesn't mean you aren't guilty of that which what is that you said something that directed someone's thoughts to something unrelated to what you were saying that's hypnosis mm. like and there's there is a whole field of things called uh, dark psychology which is uh if you've ever seen those fucking schools they always advertise the seduce women easily blah 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 that's dark psychology that is wait does it work sometimes <laughs> um it's it's utilizing the same principles that i learned but instead of using them to able to help people and understand their issues you use them to exploit weaknesses in people and there are a couple of books that i've i have and i've read that are kind of on the subject the the best book i can recommend to people if you really want to go down this rabbit hole is there's an author named robert green who wrote a book called the 48 laws of power mm -hmm. and that is kind of a breakdown of exactly what's involved in dark psychology and it's a lot of the same things that i use mm -hmm. only it uses it and in, instead of directing someone to better behavior it's manipulating someone for their own will mm. i'm going to derail this train some more if there was a uh <laughs> <laughs> if there was a hypnotherapist in north korea what do you think that would look like as in uh a bit I'm, of a bowl haircut <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah, I, was to say, I could tell you the haircut he'd have. <laughs> um, well, there probably are. Um, I don't know what the North Korean version of the commissariat is or if they have one, but it's like the political military. It's the propaganda police, basically. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that tell you what to think. So, really, uh, the best example of hypnosis in North Korea is media. Because they scare the shit out of you. They tell you what to think. And they don't just suggest to you what you should think. They tell you exactly what you are to think. And you know that there are consequences to not doing that. So because of that, that, that known, you automatically accept that. It's like, um, like 1984. The 2 plus 2 equals 5. You know have you never read 1984? You look no, no, I haven't. Okay, okay. So there's this, there's this concept in there. Like 1984 is all about Big Brother, government surveillance state, and all of that. And they have this thing that's in the book. It's two plus two equals five because the government says so. Mm -hmm. It's what's it's used to describe what they call double think, and it's where you know deep down that two plus two equals four, but you've been told. The two plus two equals five. But now two plus two must also equal five, but it also equals four. And you have to hold these two opposing thoughts in your head simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the best ways to keep somebody off balance, to keep someone confused. If their head is full of double think, they don't have opinions. They don't have a way, a direct, clear train of thought.
because their brain has been filled with nothing but contradicting opinions. Mm. Got to keep track of all the extra stuff. Well, I, I would think in North Korea, um, I, I, the you don't have there wouldn't be extra because there's there's no there's only one one thing with the propaganda. You're not even allowed to deviate. I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's also it, a lot of times they're telling you something that doesn't match to reality. So doesn't unless matter. You're, yeah, you got to ignore reality and also or worship. Or you change your John. perception. Yeah. Well, I think I think I don't know. I don't. Uh, you know me. I, I love North Korea is kind of like my top like ten, if not top five topics. To I just think it's the worst country in the world. I wish I could do something to help them. Um, I've even I even looked at. Um, there's like a website help. Uh, you could donate money to help um, pay for a North Korean to escape. Um, but anyway, really? yeah, yeah, um, it, it's it's pretty interesting. It's around. I think it was around two. I think it was around like two or three thousand dollars at the the last time I checked a couple years ago. Um, it's like a go for me. Thing <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, uh, I don't know how I got a hold of this, but that's a North Korean coin. Ta-da. Oh wow, that is illegal as shit in the country for me to have that. So I have a death sentence in North Korea. Not <laughs> yeah. You're not allowed to go there now. <laughs> oh no. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was, what was that? I was thinking if the propaganda in, in North Korea, if that's, um, what they tell you and you have no way of, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, they, they, they're telling you the United States is bad, um, uh, in North Korea, yes. <laughs> they, there's no way for them to see anything else. So there's no other reality. So that there's is no the dissenting reality. opinion. Yeah. Well, what there's was that? Only- there's no dissenting opinion. There yeah, is only yeah. the state stance, and that is the one you take. And if you decide not to take it, they got a place for you. Mm. And that's that's kind of the the only option. Like, and it's to the point that because of that fear, there is no question. Yeah, you can you can legitimately tell some of these people that the grass isn't green, that it's purple, and they will absolutely agree with you. Because they know what the consequences for not agreeing with you are. So there's a safeguard in their mind to, okay, we believe this now. Because Mm -hmm. this is how we self-preserve. Yeah, I think I would do the same if you're going to send me to a concentration Mm -hmm. camp. Most people would. Yeah, Most people would. (laughs) Like, and that's that's how most power is kept. Mm -hmm. Like, fear is all too often used to keep people in line. And I understand there are assholes. There's people that, and this is contentious among my peers, but I firmly believe there's just people you can't help. Like some people are beyond growth. They're not interested. They're happy the way they are, mm-hmm. even if they're assholes. Um, but a lot of it has to do with fear. People don't think a certain way because they're afraid either of the way society will view them or their peers or just the way they'll be perceived in general. Mm -hmm. They don't voice this opinion and they don't think a certain way. Um, And the same thing can be said about making people think a certain way, how people can hold provably wrong opinions yet still hold to them. If you ever encounter somebody, you could put evidence in front of them say you are wrong here is why and they still say no i still think i'm right that's probably a hypnotic suggestion that is probably something that has been put in their head and you will never ever show them enough evidence to to convince them otherwise Mm -hmm. um people just choose to believe what they're told they don't even choose to believe it um one of the things that I like to illustrate to people is I like to walk you through the standard morning in this country uh, where, like I told you, 30 minutes after you wake up, you're in trance. Well, most of this country is waking up to a horrible screeching alarm. And while in that trance state, they're turning on the news with bright flashing colors, which overload you and put you into a hyper suggestible state. Whereupon you are told the way you are supposed to feel for that day while you get your cup of stimulant ready for the day. 
And then while you're still in that hypnotic state, being told what you were supposed to think for the day, you ingest your stimulant, get in your car, drive to work, and you know, listen to a radio that tells you more about what you're supposed to think and the way that you're supposed to think. And increasingly, facts don't seem to matter much anymore. Empirical data does not seem to matter anymore. And that, that galls me, particularly because I'm the type of person that if you show me hard data, I immediately change my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't matter how, how strong I hold of that belief. If you show me something to prove or disprove it, I will change the way I think which is the way a human should operate. You should think a certain way until such time as you get different information. That's the way you grow. That's the way you learn. That's not what's being done right now. People, there is like a resistance to learning. There is a resistance to knowing better because it resists or it defies a narrative that has been created. And it doesn't matter which side of the narrative it is. It's... It's, the, it's a different side of the same coin. It's the same strange, divisive narrative. And like I had said before, I don't think this is a political issue. There might be places in the world where politics is still an issue, but this boils down to class. This boils down to the people that have the money and the people that do not. Because we are the richest nation on the planet, yet our population is poor. Why the fuck is that? That's strange. Oh, it's because 90% of our wealth lies within the top 5% of people. It doesn't work. And again, I ask, what's the end game to this? Already, we're not being paid a living wage. Already, they're trying to look for ways to pay us less and things get more expensive around us. So where does this end? At what point does this end? And that's how not how greed is. works. <laughs> yeah, that's not how greed works. They don't take the end point into consideration. That's greed right, just more. is never in. Yeah, it's just more. And that's the problem we've dealt with because up until now, there's always been more. Well, now, fuck, planet's on fire, resources are running out, and no one's got no money. So what now? What do we do? I don't really know. I, I would love to give a kooky crackpot answer to how we fix this. But I really don't know. Yeah, I, I, I ponder about those things a lot. I, my theory is uh, um, if uh, more empathy, I, th I think if humans figure it <laughs> out, and then I think the empathy, th though, I think this concrete jungle, I, I don't know the answer to that one. I think actually you're the first person to kind of elude me into a, th a thought that maybe, maybe if we spread out a little bit. Um, we are social be uh, creatures. I, I think that is the social thing. We do need it. But are but do you we... know about the neocortex? No. The neocortex is a part of the brain that is existent in all advanced primates. And it is the, the, the size of it determines the size of your pack or your tribe. Uh, the number of people, quite literally, that you are physically able to give a shit about. Mm. And anyone outside of this number, you, you can't. Your brain literally does not have the bandwidth. The emotional bandwidth to deal with it. That number is 150. It's not a lot, mm -hmm. and that's that's the that's the number of the people we're supposed to be associated with. We're supposed to run in packs or tribes of 150, because that's the maximum number of people physiologically you could show compassion for. Because we can look at pictures of Koreans suffering at the DMZ, or Africans starving in the street. And we care, but we don't care like we would if it was our mother or our wife or our child. Like, we don't mm -hmm. feel the same acute hurt because we can't. We, we physiologically cannot. And so it's we a need tricky bigger thing. neocortexes. I don't know if it's possible to have one big enough to what we need. <laughs> Are, in and, the animal kingdom, do we have the largest one? I don't believe so. Um, there are other advanced primates that live in much larger systems than us. Uh, if you 
boil it down to you're working within your neocortex and not crammed within a city. But there, even within ape populations, we've noticed what happens whenever the neocortex number is exceeded. They start fucking killing each other. Yeah. Like, uh, there there's a, to be war. an amazing documentary, um, Warrior, Warrior of the Ape. I, 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 I'll... I'll link the description I'll, I'll, in, in the YouTube video, but um, it's, it's, phen- it's phenomenal. There's a, a group of, of it wasn't ch- um, chimpanzees. It was, I, was it bonobos? I forget, man. It's been a couple of years since I watched it, but um, their numbers, uh, they, they have the largest tribe, th- this specific ape tribe that this, uh, these scientists were following. Once it hits about, um, I think it was a, I think that about 150, but normally the smaller ones, even about 50, they start getting into big battles with each other and start mm-hmm. having um, hierarchical battles in, in, amongst themselves. But even then, the 150 will go start, once they get strong enough, they start to seek out other ape tribes and start taking them out. I mean, it's brutal. Um, some of these killings, is just it looks like it's for just the fun. There's, there's no yeah. f- food involved. Uh, just, they're just mutilating each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's at- and I, I know which one you're talking about. I don't think it's the bonobos because the bonobos just fuck out their differences. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> orangutans. Like, no, 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 really, not, a, not orangutans. Um, but it's it, it it it's illustrative as to what's going on because how how could one human being murder or rape another human being? Because you don't give a shit because they're not connected enough to you. Would that person murder or rape their own cousin or brother or sister? Probably not because they are within that person's sphere of give a shit. But you you get out of that area, you exceed the limits of your neocortex, you no longer care. You just don't have the the, the literal bandwidth for it. Well, this is why uh, hockey teams are great because the uh, Vegas Golden Knights have arrived in Las Vegas and have united 60,000 people to be one tribe. We didn't used Why? to have a ho- we didn't used to have a hockey team, but uh I don't know, about 3 or 4 years ago, hockey arrived in Las Vegas and people who are Golden Knights fans, they just they love it. They're they're brotherly. If you go to a game, everybody's super happy and they see each other as fellow, you know, tribesmen, right? So our sports teams a way to shortcut this neocortex limitation. Can we include all Raider fans as our brothers Vegas and sisters? Does not need a hockey. Team. <laughs> I'll say that right now. Uh, so it's interesting that you bring up sports. Yeah, because that is an enforced tribal dynamic. Yeah, it's very tribal. It right? is. Yeah. It is the unifying flag that you can come together with other people for. You you all know that you have something in common. You don't need to know that person. You don't need to talk to that person. But you know you have something in common. You That's have a automatic bond. automatic membership. Exactly, automatic membership. But it's that same concept of sports teams can be elevated to nationalism. Yeah, because that same concept of our teams better than your team. Mm-hmm. That's, that's nationalism you just put a flag on it instead of a sports logo and it's the exact same thing yeah and it's this it's this attempt to find meaning in this society that we no longer have a community it's this fact that we live in places with millions of us around and yet we're not even touching our neocortex we don't have a tribe we don't have an association so in these moments that we could get together with people and flag wave or cheer for a team or worship the same God. Or watch the Olympics. There is, or watch the Olympics, though I don't know why you would. Uh, <laughs> so you could cheer I've, for your country. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've maintained that the Olympics would only be interesting if you could get drafted. Into like, the Olympics? <laughs> yeah. Like, you just got a card one day. It said, congratulations, you're now an Olympic power lifter. Report to the airport. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you have fun. Yeah. <laughs> but it's... 
random oh, no. selection it's, for the Olympics. You are right, though. Uh, the Olympics is nationalism exemplified. Everyone carries their flag into a central area. And what is the Olympics but a nice way of trying to show other people that your country's better? Mm-hmm. That's why we made such a big pissing contest over who had more medals, us or China. Like, Are we winning? I think we won by one, I think. I think is we won by one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think they got like one gold medal more than us. But we uh, got more medals total, or the other way around. Um, oh, uh, from what I remember, it was uh, the gold me- uh, We, it was on the like the last like the last event. The gold medal winner for America put us one over uh, China, but uh, that's what I, I think I remember. We're number one at being number one. <laughs> I mean, we're number one at a lot of things right now. It's just none of the things we want to be number one in. Suck it, China. Like, <laughs> suck it, China. Yeah. Oh, yeah, God. kind of uh, stating the obvious, I think, um, the nationalism thing. I, there's times where certain people, I, I can't think of a s- example right now, but when they say something about doing something great for America or whatever, I, and I think of it like, no, we should just do something great that it's for people, that humanity. Yeah. It, it shouldn't Why, be. Why are we talking country why are we talking where we are like until such time as everyone is at a level we're all kind of brought down by it because while we're still having our our shoes manufactured by children in some foreign country while we're still exploiting developing nations for their natural resources there's not really any progress to be had because that's it doesn't matter if you have a country that is peaceful and advanced if it exists off the backs of undeveloped nations and there's no need for that anymore are I you telling me i should include a... uganda in my tribe not uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck those I, guys too it's off it's off topic have you seen the african movies coming out no like the the action movies oh my god <laughs> so I, th- I might be uganda <laughs> but uh they're making like low budget action movies yeah and it is the funniest shit they're not trying to be serious they're just making the dumbest crap you've ever seen but it's so funny sounds it entertaining the worst but they know it's the worst so you can't even hate on it all right uganda you're in <laughs> yep you're in you're, you won your you won your place back good job <laughs> <laughs> I want to say I watched like a Vice News uh, short documentary on that. Yeah. I forget which. Yeah. yeah, I forget which African country it was. It, uh, it looked like, Uganda. if I remember, it was just because uh, they didn't. They don't have a Hollywood, and it's just mm-hmm. uh, people, commoners that are getting access to video cameras and well, and or smartphones that have a decent camera. And and that's kind of an interesting lead in because when I talk about um, how other countries, there's no reason for them. To not be built up. Why is Africa the way that it is? Why does Africa have no education and no infrastructure? Because mosquitoes. Didn't build it. Because we didn't give them anything because we're trying to keep them down. Africa is the most mineral rich continent on earth. They have so much diamonds and oil and all manner of natural resources, but colonialism that they never got the opportunity to take advantage of that Mm. and i can't even place the blame for this on america the blame for this goes to france belgium germany dutch and all the places that (laughs) the uk and the fucking uk uh i think china is big in africa right now they're uh they're investing everywhere right now yeah they're investing in getting their hands on those resources yes where and i've talked about this if the African people were simply given education and infrastructure, they would be the top continent on the planet. They would be Wakanda would actually exist because of the sheer amount of resources that they have that they're not even allowed to manage themselves. Yeah. Because I don't know. Oh, I know. I too I many witches. <laughs> too, too many, many witches. Witch doc- too many witch doctors. <laughs> like I. I find the idea of colonialism so bizarre. And I was talking to one of my peers in India today, and we're talking about this. He mentioned the fucking British. Look at what the British did to India. Walked up in there. 
all right, we run this now. Yeah. This is our country. That's nice. Uh, fall in line. Like, well, that's what happens when you have the guns, country. right? Whoever exactly. gets the guns and, first. Yeah. And look at what happened in this country. There was a vast array of fully developed, civilized tribal people who just didn't have a concept of the level of violence or deception that we brought to the table. Mm. And because we had the most guns, and because we had the most dishonesty, we won. Mm-hmm. If you could call that any kind of victory. And I've there's a book I recommend everyone read, in this country or not, called A People's History of the United States. Mm. It's by a man named Howard Zinn. And it gives a realistic account of our history. And one of the things that I learned that I, I really didn't care for was over the course of the years, we wrote, I believe it was 432 treaties with the native tribes. Mm. You know how many we honored? Mm. Uh, I was going to say Zero. three or four. Three or four. We literally <laughs> broke every single agreement and treaty we ever made. Like, do not do business with America. We will screw you on that bill. Okay, like, so if all of the current Native Americans left around, united and formed an army and took over Washington, D.C., that would be justice. No, I don't think there even is justice to be had anymore. Revenge? Like, revenge is really all you can ever hope for. <laughs> like, and even then, like, how much can you really get? Yeah. Because, like, get the mint. In, in the place I'm at in Arkansas, it's by something called the Washita National Forest, yeah. named after the Washita tribe. Uh, the closest member of the Washita tribe still living is in fucking Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not even in this area anymore. Yeah. Like, it's it's the strangest thing to me. And, like, yeah, they just ruled that, like, the majority of Oklahoma is tribal land. And been in mm-hmm. Oklahoma? No. There's no. It's bullshit. Is there that is where the Dust Bowl other, was? Uh, Kansas. Oh, is, okay. But it's right. in the same general area. And again, no hate to anyone in Oklahoma. I'm just saying you can move anytime. But it there doesn't seem to be <laughs> there. If you're going to move and, somewhere, don't go to Oklahoma or New Mexico. I mean, or do, I imagine, land cheap. <laughs> but like, like, there's no people here. Now you got eight Estonians and 12 <laughs> Oklahomans pissed off at you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe two Ugandans. You might not like that shit. Uh, did, hey, did you like the band uh, Pantera growing up? Uh, no. Okay. I um, Specifically because I had a friend <laughs> that that is all he listened to. Ah, and what yeah. I mean... That's all he listened to. That implies that he had a catalog of music, yeah. but he did not. He had Cowboys from Hell, and that was all. <laughs> and that was all one he would play. <laughs> yes, and that's yeah. all he would play constantly. Yeah. So, like, yeah, Pantera they did, at least, got they did at least two other albums. It would have been they, cool. They need something yeah. to mix it up. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time I should have known this was the, the beginning of the end for Metallica. It was when uh, <laughs> Saint Anger first came out. He actually bought a new fucking CD. Yeah. And I worked with the guy, and I go into his office, and I go, Jesus fucking Christ, dude, I appreciate the fact that you got a new CD, but can you play more than one song off of it? <laughs> and he looked at me and went, I've been playing the whole album. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh. Metallica's gotten shitty. Eh, cool. It's all a matter of taste. It what? is, but yeah, but I don't like that album either. I, was about to say, I will not entertain any Metallica <laughs> apologies. I've always been a Dave Mustaine fan. So like, <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> you you got the whole uh, Metallica nation pissed off at you now. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, the metal, metal militia is coming I for just, you. I just racked up a bunch right there. <laughs> the Lithuanians and the Ugandans. I just pissed off the Metallica fans. Hell yeah. Okay, if they can get up out their chair, I might be worried. You can find J. Robert Parker in Oklahoma. <laughs> Go find him there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, man, 
I was one of those that when Metallica did that Napster bullshit, I just kind of, that killed it for me. No, it was just like, Lars. They, it wasn't the whole Metallica. It was mainly Lars. It was Lars and James. <laughs> like I don't remember. And that's this. why Jason. That's why Jason left. Uh, and Kirk Hammett just. I don't think he cares anymore. <laughs> but like James Hetfield is going to do anything Lars Ulrich says. In yeah. the end, he doesn't have a thought of his own. And anyone that believes Metallica is good. I challenge you to go on YouTube right now and type in the search term, Lars is a shitty drummer. <laughs> and you will get video from a documentary of Lars not knowing how to play the drums. And I don't mean in the beginning of their career. I mean in like 1999 or 2004, right around there. And like this little Dutch fuck can't even play his drum set. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. All right. <laughs> so yeah, fuck Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your thoughts on the uh, hypnotherapy and 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 psychology? Uh, what's your perspective on the two? I I've had this conversation with somebody, and I believe they're going to grow together more. Uh, psychology kind of hates hypnotherapy to an extent, or it used to, because they think we're encroaching on their territory. Mm. But. Um, in the end, we possess a tool that they need to understand their own job. So the choice is either hypnosis becomes integrated into psychology or we become sister professions. Mm. Um, and really, I would prefer it they we just become sister professions. And of the psychs I've talked to, I get a pretty good reception from, from what I do. Because I, I let them, I'm not trying to be a psychologist. I don't have that education. Mm -hmm. What I do have an education in is a very specific tool, a very specific map of how to use that tool. And that, that same map and that same tool can, can aid in that information, can aid in that, that knowledge. And I do know a lot of psychs that have a lot of interest in hypnosis. Um, there's some in a professional group that I'm in that they just hang around and read the articles that we share, ask questions sometimes whenever we start talking shop just so they know a little bit more about what's going on. But it's actually surprised me on the whole, the lack of hostility uh, from that profession towards us. Because there used to be a lack of hostility. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a lot of hostility between mm -hmm. the psych community and the hypnosis community, uh, particularly in California, because the California psych community wanted to make it to where anyone that even wanted to talk to someone for a living had to be a licensed psychotherapist. Mm. So, so we got to we got to find Long an time. MMA psychologist to see how that plays out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, might be one out there. <laughs> Yeah, from what what you've been saying and saying earlier about free will, suggesting uh, things to people, um, it, it to me it seems like a, a an over overlap. Or as you and then even la later just now, uh, you just said with, if it was a sister thing to psychology, I see there's there's so many things connected. Um, you're dealing with someone's personalities. You're working with their personality to enhance them on what they want. It seems so so similar. See, that's that's really the core difference, I think, between the two. Is psychology is based around understanding, and uh, understanding therapy is understanding. Oh, oh, okay. It broke up. It wasn't um, the uh, oh, okay. the connection is a little um, wonky, but whereas hypnotherapy is based upon uh, changing association. We, we mm. directly go in. Um, psychotherapy would be more finding out why you think the way you do. Mm. Uh, hypnotherapy mm, well is more said. about changing the way you think. Mm. So, so the, they can work really well together. Yeah, the, the proof in the pudding then, the, uh, the result is for hypnosis, if you have some behavior you want to change that you deliberately want to behave differently, 
then maybe that's a tool that can help someone get there. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. it is. And like I said, it's there's such a wide variety of reasons. Look at it like anyone listening right now, look at it like you haven't had free will up to now. Like you're just working off of programming. Mm-hmm. And knowing this, knowing you have this stability to take control over your own mind and the way that you think, why would you not take it? Why would you not purposely impose your will and your desires upon your own mind? Why would you choose to not continue not liking something that you knew would benefit you? Why would you choose to continue a behavior you knew was harming you? And I understand it's difficult to do that on your own, but there is a tool now. There is a, a set of professionals that that's what we do. We give you that ability to change your behavior change your way of thinking. Earlier when you said uh, way earlier, uh, 10 years ago you thought that um, the was it, I think it was a psychologist view hypnotherapy differently now or was it, did, I forget if you said it was people in general view hypnotherapy very differently. People in general. Yeah. Um, and it's not as many people as I like view it differently, which is part of the reason I do these interviews. Is because I, I want it to be known that regardless of all of this mystique and all of this association with stage performance, that hypnosis is not only real, it's, it's a natural process. It is a thing that your body and your mind just do. And it is something that can be exploited to your advantage. Mm. Uh, the interesting question that I still have not found an answer for is uh, why? Why do we have this thing? Why is our brain able to be programmed like this? And I don't know. Um, There is a school of thought that says that the ability to be hypnotized is a relatively recent human development. And that what's called metaprogramming, the ability to willfully and consciously change your thoughts and behaviors, is the next step in evolution of the human mind. Mm. It's like the whole, we don't have free will until such time as we give ourselves free will. Uh, Now we have the ability to give ourselves free will and be who we want to be and be what we want to be. And of course, these statements are all within reason. Mm. I can't take somebody and make them instantly into a millionaire. Right. And take somebody that does not have the mindset needed to be a millionaire and give them the mindset and the drive and dedication required to do that. But I can't just snap my fingers and make it happen. Can we make you like Metallica? <laughs> no. <laughs> no force on earth can do that. What is uh, Twin Ravens? Is there a, uh, a, a story behind the name of your company? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, Partially, it is because of my children. I have twins, uh, Maximus and Halo. Uh, and I you named them both Raven. No. Nah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but the, the other side to it is, according to uh, Norse legend, Odin had two Ravens uh, uh. named Thought and Memory. Uh. That every day he would set out into the world, and every night they would come back and tell him the secrets of humanity. And so I named them after his ravens. Oh, that's cool. Or named the company after that. So they're like spying uh, because, satellites. Well, basically, because the two <laughs> things that I use in my job are thought and memory. Nice. That's really cool. What's the most mis, uh, the most common misconception of hypnotherapy? I'm, I'm, I believe we already talked about some, but... Um, uh, just that the, it's mind control. Um, wow. the, it's actually the exact opposite. Uh, hypnosis, if anything, is taking control over your own mind. Like we had said, these associations that you were acting with outside of your control, hypnosis gives you control over that. It lets you choose. So there's this perception that by going under hypnosis, you, you abandon your freedom, you abandon your cognition. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. Unless it's very deep hypnosis, you know everything that's going on. You're aware how much attention you're paying is kind of in the moment but i i know some people that can recall a hundred percent of what i said in hypnosis 
Mm. I know some people that can't recall a single word. So, yeah. and that's sometimes tricky because you kind of need people to remember sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Got to remember something. Come on. <laughs> I remember something. Uh, I end up having to send them like uh, follow up emails just to let them know like what we went over and stuff. Oh, here's a recap. Here's a recap, basically. Yeah. Here's what you need to remember from last time. <laughs> What are some of the hardest clients you have to, uh, you've had to work with? The angry I, I, ones. You, I, I only thought about it because you said, so, like, say someone that can't remember something, that would be tough. But um. A lot of the trauma clients mm-hmm. is very difficult. Um, one, from, from a personal standpoint, because we're dealing with things that are very hard to, to address even from the outside, but there's a lot of resistance sometimes to to letting go of that trauma especially if it's something that you've had your entire life Mm. that this this dark event or series of events is somehow a sense of comfort to you because it's it's always been there it's Mm -hmm. it defines you and sometimes it can be very difficult to to take people through that letting go process Mm. to to help them address it and properly let it go sometimes it takes a little time um it's all in perspective though so many issues i've seen resolved with people just from changing the way you view the situation changing the way you look at it and perceive it and sometimes that's all it takes sometimes just it's just a matter of somebody gets a different look at the situation from a different way mm-hmm. they're like oh that that comes together that makes sense now i can understand that sometimes there's there's the resistance to it some people don't want to let go of their trauma either because of people associated with it or because of their own personal identity uh some people use their trauma as a shield and they don't want to let go of what they view as a sense of security Mm. and it's those those are usually the most difficult ones Uh, it's not just but uh, is there by any chance any key indicators on uh, if someone's, whether it be trauma or not, uh, someone that should seek your uh, services and someone that shouldn't seek their services due to key, inter- uh, key indicators that they see about themselves? Well, there's nothing that would ever indicate that you do not. <clears throat> um, so if I want to hypnotize women into being nymphomaniacs. <laughs> uh I, mean, I, I don't know do. if I call that doable. Uh, that's going to require some. Uh, I'm going to read that book. I got, I got, yeah, read that book. 48 Laws, 48 of, Laws power. of Power. There's also another book that he wrote called The uh, The Art of Seduction. Uh, so he, he's got you covered. Um, it's right up my alley. Send me money, Robert. Uh, just sold two books for you, bro. I just sold two fucking books. Cough up. <laughs> Emmett's buying two for himself. <laughs> well, I mean, if I lose it, I don't want to be in the rule number 12 and not know what the fuck to do next. <laughs> Sorry, but, law number yeah, 12. I, <laughs> there's not really anyone I would say look elsewhere. And a lot of it, like, there's there's some issues and some people I can't help with. And that's really part of why I do free consultations. Um, I need to know who you are. You need mm. to know who I am sense of your problem and if i feel i can help you with it and if i don't feel like i can help you with it i'm not just going to tell you to fuck off i'm going to tell you that i think this is a little bit beyond what i normally work with <laughs> unless you're a uh, shitty drummer named lars Ulrich, <laughs> you can fuck you know, off you can fuck in that case <laughs> um but I, i'll just refer them out to one of my one of my peers most of my friends are hypnotherapists so you can go talk to them they can deal with you better <laughs> you can go work with somebody with terrible taste in music. <laughs> work with some bullshit. I don't know. I fucking work with Lars. He's probably still got money for now. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> that's going back to changing your opinion on things <laughs> due to facts or, <laughs> or information. Yeah. Hey, um, so I saw an article today that uh, you can... Uh, so if, if somebody's a psychopath and if you're uh, interviewing them, some dude that interviewed a lot of psychopaths noticed that they have kind of like a psychopath stare and they don't move much. 
So they started recording psychopaths in these interviews and then tracking the head movements. So, right. So they, they, they studied, I think like 300 psychopaths or 300, you know, interviewees. And they go, you know, the psychopaths tend to not move as much. And so if you throw this into a computer, you can measure how much somebody's moving or how much their head is moving. Interesting fact. Yeah. There is, there is something called abreactions in hypnosis. Abreaction. Yeah. Which is where like you say a word that triggers like a bad feeling and you'll actually Mm -hmm. see like somebody like move away from it or something. Yeah. Uh, There is something called psychotic sway. Psychotic uh, sway. Which is for whatever reason, uh, people that are psychotic, when you hypnotize them, they'll sit there and they'll go in circles like that. And it's not always an indication of psychosis, but it's enough of a red flag that we were taught that if you see this, you end the session and call the police, send them out the door. (laughs) Yeah. They might kill Um, you. (laughs) Personality disorders are not to be hypnotized. Uh, Things like BPD, schizophrenia, things like that, because you don't know their roadmap. You don't know what you're working with in their head. So it's, and I'm sure it's been done successfully, but yeah. it's very dangerous because you don't know the way they're thinking. Yeah, the idea really that their narcissist. their mental state is broken and is so abnormal that it's not not something you want to mess with. Is that the you would need to know how they even think to yeah. begin to help them, and how how do you work with <laughs> associations? If someone has abnormal associations, mm-hmm. they could associate the color purple with a fucking green hell beast that tries to eat them every night. Yeah. Like you, you just don't know all of these things. time to chop off people's ears. I'm chop off people's ears. That was a sign, <laughs> but it's, I've never worked with anyone or even had anyone come to me with, I had suspicions, had any type of psychosis this way. Um, this the way I've never personally seen that. I've only heard of it. Okay. Uh, and it's apparently pretty rare, mm. but I, I also don't deal with a lot of people. Uh, I keep a very small client base. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't work with a lot of people. Uh, I don't usually have too many openings. So if anyone's interested in working with me, I recommend giving me a call or getting on schedule. You have but, to be a stalker to get in with Jay Robert Parker. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Again, you better tell me what underwear I'm wearing before I'll put on schedule. <laughs> the answer's none. <laughs> <laughs> and they're purple. <laughs> and they're purple. And he, all he just is like a all clown underneath his uh, clothes also. <laughs> <laughs> clown clown Trump, paint only <laughs> under my clothes. <laughs> That's right. This is actually the only part of me I don't have clown paint on. Everything else is white and polka dot under this. It does sound the psychotic. weirdest thing. My Sorry. Wall paint. I think we've gone way off the deep end here. <laughs> <laughs> on the psychopath thing, I, I watched a documentary where uh, I think the guy, he concluded that there's three things that have to happen. There's, there's actually a gene that has to be shut off. Uh, I, f- I forget exactly the terminology, but there's... Probably uh, for compassion. Uh, that the, the second one was actually your frontal lobe has to be shut off. Something uh, there's certain brain uh, readings that they could see that the frontal lobe is just where the empathy is. That one's just shut off. So you have to have one the gene turn off. The frontal lobe has to be turned off. And then number three, they said uh, he said is you have to you have to have a bad childhood. Mm. If you have if you don't have all three, have one and two, it's fine. Like you'll just end yeah. up with an odd job or like CEO. The, president well, i'm about to say ceo <laughs> politics yeah yeah something like that republican <laughs> yeah but it's strange to think that the only thing separating these these ceos and these scummy politicians from fucking serial killers is a bad childhood yeah, they, yeah. Just somebody saying the wrong thing to them and that's it that's literally it yeah and that's that's kind of part of the reason why i think our government's broken because it inherently attracts narcissists and psychopaths. Well, that's like I would say the the government and or the capitalist system. I I, I could see yes. both. Yeah, yeah. I see both well, it's here. the same thing. It is power with without care. It's power without personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's 
it's interesting because you always hear that thing the serial killers and ceos have the same mindset and it's true and if you think about it because like a ceo will always tell you i've never killed anyone mm-hmm. i've never hurt anyone but have you mm-hmm. because like i'm a i'm a big fan of responsibility for indirect action and yeah. if through your indirect action you caused a bunch of people to lose their job and a few people to commit suicide to me those suicides are on you mm-hmm. so it's we we look we turn a blind eye to so much in today's day and age because it is, it is not explicitly illegal it is not specifically said in the law you can't do this so people get away with it yeah. like these billionaires that don't fucking pay taxes oh they just have good tax lawyers you fucking clown you don't you don't have good tax lawyers to not pay taxes on five billion fucking dollars that's not a good tax lawyer that's cheating the fucking system but it's not illegal because they're using the fucking even no, though because they, they paid the guys that wrote the laws exactly <laughs> and it's yeah. not illegal even though it is totally immoral and reprehensible yeah and they're there he absolutely should have to call uh, to answer for it it's not illegal no takes you backsies who cares like it's and i hate to use the m word because i hate the word morality because oh, I think such, he's a motherfucker. <laughs> oh no i love that word <laughs> but uh morality is such a weird thing because what's moral one place is not moral in another place and like what even defines that to begin with but uh, I, th- I think I it's believe- pretty easy it's, it's it's just whether your impact on somebody else is good or bad that makes it really easy like that's, is what i'm doing is that gonna benefit somebody or hurt somebody it makes it really that's easy actually it's a really good definition that's a really simple thing yeah is the thing that i'm doing going to impact someone positively or negatively yeah and that's yeah. that's a that's a very simple good way to put it and that can be used for every fucking thing. Mm-hmm. When you go check out at the grocery store, are you having a positive impact on this person's life in this little two minute of interaction? Or have you made this poor wage slave's life hell? Yeah. Like, and it's, I have weird standards for what I consider good people. Have you ever heard of the shopping cart test? Uh, I think I have heard, yeah, yeah. Would so you- the shopping cart, is the ultimate test of your usefulness as a citizen and because there is no no incentive to put the cart back there is no punishment for not doing yet it is an indisputably good thing to do for other people and no one ever sees you do it so what do you do with the shopping cart do you when no one's looking choose to inconvenience yourself for the convenience of the next person or do you just say fuck it and let somebody clean up your mess and that that mentality while it seems silly to to say a shopping cart that mentality goes to so much more like it, it speaks of compassion it speaks of your willingness to act selflessly in a society to be able to ensure that it runs better yeah, but could we say that uh, if we all walked our shopping cart back to the door, we'd be putting shopping cart attendants out of work? Would that be a uh, negative impact? That's not a real job. In that <laughs> no, nobody's. I don't. I don't want to insult anyone. Like uh, real to want to insult anyone doing it. It's like four guys but at Home Depot the, right now. <laughs> nobody's just going and retrieving carts anymore. <laughs> that's something they make you do on top of eight other things. Uh, yeah. I, it would be nice if there was still the parking lot guy. I'm sure somebody would enjoy that, but yeah, that job's been cut. You could just make Gary do it. Like, you know, what's my actual motivation for uh, stowing the shopping cart when I'm done is uh, I don't want that cart to roll away and hit somebody's car. I think that's my yeah. motivation. And that's that's still the same motivation. You are stowing out that they're stowing away that object to ensure that nobody else has to deal with the negative consequences. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're doing it to to convenience the the worker or to protect other people's property. It is the selflessness of the act. It is the fact that you could have not done it and not received 
any punishment, nobody would have thought any differently of you. But but you do it to preserve the, the politeness of society. So do you think it's immoral for some dumb shit to leave their cart? Oh, that's probably not fair. I'm judging them. Is it immoral for a, a citizen to leave the cart exactly where it is when they're done loading their groceries? It speaks to a laziness that <laughs> into other places in their life. That, yeah. that yes. same person that would not put up a, cu- a cart for the convenience of another human being would not open the door for another human being that needed it. They would not help someone across the street who required it. There are some very basic things that can be done in society to just make everyone around you's life a little easier. Because life fucking sucks for all of us. None of us get out of this thing alive. So do you go through your life pissing people off and making people angry and more miserable? Or do you try to make it better? And that's really the the change that I went through. I used to be the guy that would piss everyone off just to get a laugh and all of that. And eventually, it was, it was, do do I want to live like that? Do I get more satisfaction helping people? And I do. Like, yeah, you might think you're funny, like, pissing someone off with a shopping cart or playing a prank on someone, but have you ever, like, actually help someone get through their day have you had somebody thank you with real gratitude because you helped them do something or figure out something that no one else would and that way trumps any satisfaction you would get from being a dick to someone and that's not to say don't have fun and don't play pranks but everyone's life is hard enough i'm actually like, kind of anti-prank i'm a non-pranker yeah, I am too, uh, because there's no good end to it. Like, the Wait, evolution you... of the prank war is just eventually someone gets pissed off enough to end it. Like, oh, it's yeah. not. Well, if, it's, if not it's a war, fun. then then presumably both parties want to do it, right? I, well, I wouldn't some, be mad if somebody at pranks you. What are you yeah. gonna do? If somebody pranks me, get... I uh, I react very negatively and I express. I don't like pranks and I don't. But a lot of people will get them back. Yeah. And by re engaging in that behavior, what does the other person do? They re engage with that and there's a game. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. I'm not the biggest fan of pranks. Yeah. uh, It's one thing, depending on who someone is. Like if that's the relationship and we're partying and we're having fun. And shit's just whatever. Might light yeah, their pants it's a on fire. Prank. Yeah, yeah, it's whatever. I've lit if I've lit someone's leg on fire for a prank before, it was funny. <laughs> but <laughs> it was it was just lighter fuel. It was fine. <laughs> but was this in Arkansas or in New York City? <laughs> no, <laughs> not New York. Oh, uh, funny story actually about New York City. I've got a knife <laughs> that I took someone. I took off of someone in New York City. Oh, because there was this weird drunk guy that was following around me and my friend. Yeah, and uh, he cornered us at one point, and I was drunk as hell. Like he was, like he was trying to mug you? No, he was oh. trying to talk to my friend. Oh. At one point, he pulls out a knife and goes, "You know, I'd give my life for you, right?" Hmm. And he turns the knife around to himself. Oh, weird! And I just walk by him and just snatch the knife out of his hand. Yeah, and. I'm about to throw it into the construction yard by us. And I just stop and look. It's a fucking Gerber. Mm. It's a nice knife. So <laughs> I just put it in my pocket. <laughs> you mugged him. <laughs> I mugged him. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I still have that knife. And it's still, it Wait, kind so of reminds me. What was, what was the emotional state of this person? Like he was trying to uh, confess his love or what's the... Uh... And... He had some weird messianic complex. He, was, I, he had a mental illness. I don't know what it was that made him do this. Yeah. But that event kind of started this change of how I thought to deal with people. Because I could have just as easily just beat that guy's brakes off and yeah. been totally 
legally within my means. Yeah. But instead, I disarmed him and we walked him to a subway and we put him on a subway home. We paid for his fare and we put him on a subway home. Yeah. No one got hurt. No one went to jail. And you got a knife. I got a new knife. Yeah. Yeah, I got a new (laughs) knife. And like, that's really, that, that, that lesson taught me a lot because there's what you can do and there's what you should do. Like, could I have just fucking started slamming that guy's head against the wall? Yeah, legally. Absolutely could have. <laughs> Should I have? Yeah, morally, not really. That guy didn't deserve it. He mm-hmm. obviously had something wrong with him. He needed to be disarmed and sent home. Yeah. Which is exactly what happened. And that's that's kind of the goes back to the whole community thing we were talking about. We're all people. We have problems. It doesn't matter where we come from, what country we come from, what language we speak. We're all kind of the same. The fact of the matter is, I could dump you off in fucking Croatia somewhere. Somewhere that doesn't speak your language at all. And if you're hungry, you can get food. If you're tired, you can get a place to sleep. There's basic communication you can do human to human. Only 7% of our communication is words language everything else is tone body language just everything and that's that really needs to be remembered that that universal human experience that even though you think someone's different even though they come from a different background than you they're not they're not any different y'all are both in the dirt at the end of the day Mm. like neither one of you special it doesn't matter if you got more toys than him he who dies with the most toys still fucking dies. So that's that's what I don't get. And I guess that's kind of forced me to show more compassion to, to everyone around me. Because I, I walk through life expecting everyone to understand me and to understand why I was the way I was, even though at that time I didn't. Mm. But well, why why don't we extend the same thing we expect? ourselves to other people we expect everyone to treat us with respect everyone to treat us like we've 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 made it and we've gone somewhere and we're worthy of just basic respect so why do why do some people not extend that to others why do some people choose to because you gotta have an enemy gotta have a tribe to fight against that's that's actually pretty right they're always because of the way human psychology is it's there always has to be an other and it doesn't matter if the other is a terrorist or a communist or whatever thing you want to label it. Mm-hmm. Humanity needs to have an enemy. I've always said that the only thing that will bring together humanity is a hostile alien race. Yeah. When you if bet something aliens. comes, yeah. If something comes down from the sky and it objectively wants to kill us all like, yeah, then we get along. Because the other is now apparent. It doesn't matter what religion, race, creed, or color you are. We're on the same hockey Earth. team now. Yeah, you're on the, <laughs> we're all on the same team now. Like, you're not from fucking Venus trying to eat our brains. So you're good to go. And I'll keep my neocortex right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, a lot of what you're saying resonates with me a whole lot. There's oftentimes M and I have conversations where... I'm the psychopath. (laughs) (laughs) He's asking me, why do I have such a moral compass on certain, uh, uh, on many of the actions or the many, many of the things I maybe think about in our conversations on uh, whether it be political or I don't know. So many, uh, so I I, I totally agree with you on on so much of it. I just felt like just adding that. Um, I'm going to start us into the final question sections. We got about 15 minutes and about six questions. First question. No pressure. Uh, what great <laughs> what great daily habits do you have? Um, I have a couple of things that I do. Um, there is something I do called Mental Bank, which is like an assessment of everything you've done in the day and the things you want to do. And it's just a series of like affirmations and rewards. Hmm. Um, I Mental do self-hypnosis. Bank? bank like a... <laughs> Yeah, can people look that up? Can they find Mental Bank? Yeah, 
it's oh, the, mental, the bank? mental bank ledger. Uh, uh, there is a there's a free YouTube video from the same college that I attended. Um, it's it's best done in conjunction with hypnotherapy, but it doesn't have to be done in conjunction yeah. with hypnotherapy. And it's there's a whole massive explanation I could do on it, but I just recommend people look up the mental bank. Wait, so if I do a good job with my shopping cart, I can write it down in the mental bank book? Or is it not that sort of thing? Oh, well, it depends. Um, if that decides to be like one of your value events, yeah, because there's the whole concept is they call it the mental bank because fake money is involved. Ah. You reward yourself for certain things. So say some of my value events are I go for a drive or I do my Russian lessons or yeah. I work with a client. Those all have specific sets of money associated yeah. with them. And the idea is, is it's much the same as a video game. Mm. Like you, you want more score, you want more points. Mm -hmm. And so it encourages you to have better behavior, more productive behavior. And it kind of, it, it starts drawing that, that success towards you. It changes your mindset. It changes. Dude, this is the opposite of GTA five. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, basically. And I, I, I love video games. I, that's how I, uh, honestly, that's how I decompress after the day. Yeah, like, that's that's what I do. I, okay. I play Red Dead Two too much. I, I have a, I have a little posse that I play with, and we hang out. We play cowboys, and it's fun. <laughs> nice mental bank. That's a cool uh, thing for yeah, people to look at. Yeah. All right. Next question. <clears throat> what do you know or think of cryptocurrency? Uh, I think it lost me a lot of fucking money last month. Ah! Um, I, <laughs> it is one of my primary investments, uh, that in silver, I'm a big fan of just hard silver. Mm. And, um, yeah, I had a lot of real good investments and I don't. Uh, I didn't take any money out, but my portfolio got reduced to about a third of what it was. Oof. That was neat. Yeah, so I'm just waiting it out uh, and uh, waiting for it to recover. Yeah. How long? How long have you been in? Um, well, I got in the year before and had to get out because of financial stuff. And then, beginning of the pandemic, I got back in mm. and uh, did much better of how I learned the first time mm -hmm. and now I have friends that also do it so we kind of discuss it and things like that and I've got the coins that I I choose to either take risks on or I feel are more stable mm -hmm. um, don't buy fucking Dogecoin I made that mistake <laughs> <laughs> like literally the day after I bought Dogecoin uh, fucking Musk went on SNL uh, yeah it, it'll probably be back from no a, one will be back, but okay. it doesn't make me hate Elon Musk any less. <laughs> uh, have you thought about the morality with decentralization? Uh, when you talk about being a good person and all that stuff, I feel like that's what really resonates with me with cryptocurrency. I do. I mean, I, I, I love money, but yeah. I do. I am a software engineer and I look at cryptocurrency and blockchain and how decentralization can change a pair. Yes. And to me, because I'm. I'm all about gold and the gold standard. And I am, I'm, I think one of the worst things we've done is detach ourselves from the gold standard to a currency, which is backed by nothing essentially. And cryptocurrency people are like, Oh, it doesn't have anything. And they don't understand what blockchain is. They don't understand the concept of data and that data is a, a, a physical thing. And that that is what blockchain technology represents is a piece of that data stream. Hmm. So people want to talk about how like, oh, it's nothing compared to the dollar. What the fuck backs the dollar anymore? Like mm -hmm. our money isn't silver. We don't have silver and gold certificates anymore. It's backed by nothing. So I cryptocurrency is one of those things I decided to diversify my assets into and ethically I, I am all about decentralized finance, that there is no need for central banks and centralized finance, that that is one of the things that got us into this fucking mess to begin with. Mm. So there's, 
I, outside of the potential environmental ramifications of it, which I refuse to believe, and, and the thing is with the environmental ramifications, I always hear that come up in the news. You're talking about miners. You're not talking about the, the servers that actually host these things. You're talking about the people trying to exploit the system and mine currency and how much energy they're using. That's got nothing to do with nothing when it comes to cryptocurrency. Just because yeah. you have these people like buying up all the graphics cards and draining a football field's worth of power a day, that's got nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Mm. The actual blockchain technology isn't necessarily that bad. You want to talk about bad? How much it costs to print money? Like, what's behind that? Yeah, but I would agree with you. Uh, those cryptocurrency miners are actually just using our existing power grid. They didn't invent coal-powered plants, yeah. you know. So we yeah. could have a cleaner power grid, and yeah, that would we could have a like a better power grid. Yeah, like there's no reason we should be on coal. One of the most mind-blowing things I learned about Arkansas when I moved here: we have nuke plants. For yeah. as backwards and weird as Arkansas is, it is a nuclear-powered state. Mm. which surprised the crap out of me. Yeah. And I've got somewhat mixed views of nuclear energy uh, as in terms of a power supply. It's fantastic. But in terms of how we deal with the byproduct waste, I got some questions on that. We haven't figured that one out yet. Ah, I was just buried so, in Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's out there. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those shoot it into the fucking sun types. Like, <laughs> ah, that's expensive. Yeah. Hey, there's also a Butterball Turkey Factory in Arkansas. There is. Yeah. And, uh, and Tyson Foods has a bunch of shit. Here <laughs> and, if yeah. you're wondering where your turkey's from, <laughs> they're growing oh. down in Arkansas. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, what's the biggest problem for humans? What should we do to fix it? Covered fucking that a little bit. Carts. Um, <laughs> copy cards. Put up your fucking and shopping Mars. cart. Um, but seriously, if I had to, to put it on a whole, it's unchecked greed. Unchecked greed is the number one problem with humanity. It's this notion that some people have that they deserve not just more, but all. Like, not, they, they, they don't just want to be better off than other people. They want everything and they want others to have everything nothing and until that mentality is solved and until we uh deal with the billionaire situation however way we choose that to be i'm not saying that a guillotine is the option i'm <laughs> saying that you could have gotten one with your stimulus check if you really wanted just just <laughs> just a more fat, fair tax system maybe exactly maybe. Look, Jay, if I'm landing my golden helicopter on my yacht, why should I care about your dumb ass? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Somebody's got to gotta wipe off my boots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. What's your favorite food or dish? Um, God, that's hard. I, I used to be a, a chef, so mm. oh. I make a really good chicken tikka masala that I really like. Mm. Sounds nice. But other than that, I'm really boring. One of my favorite foods is uh, rice and homemade kimchi. Mm. Like, yeah. wrap that in some seaweed. God damn, that's so good. Mm. Are you burying it's, and I, fermenting your own ca a cabbage? Uh, I don't bury it, but I do ferment it myself. Um, Weird, yeah. The kimchi I have in my fridge, I think it's been there for two months now. This is why people in I Arkansas think, think you're a witch. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Honestly, um, it's complicated shit he's doing. I don't understand it. <laughs> and I speak Russian. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> All right. Last question. Think of at least two friends or people that you know that should do this conversation. Call them out. I mean, I think my friend Carla would have a lot of fun with this. She's another hypnotherapist. Uh, she's a former Navy journalist. Um, ah. Carla and let's see, everyone I know is hypnotherapist. That's, That's okay. the problem we have right now. Yeah, limited tribe. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of who else. I've got a friend named Jordan who's also a hypnotherapist who's 
kind of the other end of things. She's more in the yeah, the the hippy dippy of it. Uh, mm. Not to not to speak ill of her or anything, but she's <laughs> way more into the metaphysical end of hypnosis and hypnotherapy. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, she's one of my peers. She's one of the ones that I consult whenever I have questions about nice. what I'm working with. Awesome. All right. So plug yourself. How how should someone contact you if they're interested in your services or what's the best way? Okay. Well, uh, like has been said a few times, my name is Jay Robert Parker. My company is called Twin Ravens Hypnotherapy and Research. Uh, you can get a hold of me through the website. It's www.twinravens.org. Mm. Uh, O-R-G, not .com. Uh, or you can shoot me an email at twinravenshypno, all one word, at protonmail.com. Or find me on Facebook. Just search Twin Ravens Hypnosis for hypnotherapy and page will pop up. Or you can just find me myself, search J. Robert Parker. Um, that, like I said, I every time I do these interviews, I encourage anyone that has any questions that wants to see some of the research that I've referenced, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And like I said, if you want to become a client, uh, I don't want to say it's exclusive or anything, but like I, said, I don't take a whole lot of clients. So if it's something you're interested in, let me know. We'll set up a free con- consultation and we can figure out what we can do for you exactly. And that, anyone wants to chat, wants to figure out more about what I do, I'm happy to answer any questions at all. You don't take on many clients, but then what's your, what is your driver to do these podcasts? Cause you've done probably three or four podcasts now. Uh, I've been published. Uh, I've done about 12. <laughs> oh, um, wow. Wow. My main driver is one to, to keep a supply of clients going. Um, cause you can't count on everyone mm. you're doing referrals and stuff like that. Cause once you know, they quit smoking, it, they don't call you back. Well, actually, they kind of stick around generally because then it's like, a, <laughs> okay. okay, well, I fixed this, so what else can we work with? Ah, uh, yeah. And then that's, that's kind of the snowball of which just fix everything. Yeah. Uh, the reason I do it is more of an education. Uh, I enjoy talking about the subject. Um, it's, it's a very fun topic. And it's, again, it's something that a lot of people have no idea about. It's, yeah. you, you say hypnosis to someone. And there's automatically all sorts of weird ideas and visuals to come in. People think it's mind control. People think it's all these things. Mm-hmm. And knowing what I know, it's, it's a simple, simple thing. And even, even if I don't get clients from these, there's still, one, the possibility of future clients. And it adds to my, my knowledge base. Yeah, credibility. Um, that's why I post them all on my website is kind of uh, it's, it's a lot to ask somebody in terms of trust to sight unseen interact with me. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if I have hours of me interviewing, not just on hypnosis, but just talking uh, that will let people know what I know that I'm being truthful when I present this, this knowledge that I'm not just one of these weekend class people that took a six hour class and now they call themselves a hypnotherapist. Um, so really it's that kind of establishing authority on the topic is, is the main reason I do it. Yeah. And it kind of helps oddly enough in my own understanding of it by explaining it to people and by explaining it to an audience and putting it out of the jargon and just explaining it in layman's terms, it helps increase my own personal understanding of what I do. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, I actually, I I think like 45 minutes in, uh, I I was like, holy cow, this guy's actually actually answering all the questions pretty well, and then- Well, uh, and that's, it's important to me that I do that, because this is, it's such a position of trust. Mm -hmm. It's such a position of vulnerability that someone is in, being hypnotized and it's important to me that people realize I know what I'm talking about that I am actually concerned for your well-being and here to help and if I can do that if, if I can convey that which I feel like I've been successful in then that simply adds to my own credibility my own authority on my specialty things like that all right, Jay, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for spending three hours with us. Thank you for shedding your knowledge. Thanks for about- having me.
Yeah, thank you for all the knowledge about hip hypnotherapy. Jay Robert Parker, good to meet you, dude. Good to meet you.